Hi, I've got my braces in because I have to start wearing my braces again because I was being a bit naughty and I weren't wearing them properly. But I sound really funny when I talk, so please forgive that. Hi, welcome back to my channel for today's video. Earlier this year, I think February or March, I, where'd I go? I went to a wedding and I picked up a random book on the car journey, you know, just to read because I was staying there for a few days at this wedding yeah and it was a Sophie Kinsella book and I like Sophie Kinsella I've read The Undomestic Goddess is it that one I read that ages like years ago like a decade ago and I quite liked that there's another one <laughs> My Not So Perfect Life yeah I read that and it was all right and I've read some of the <clears throat> shop that wasn't me being sarcastic I actually have I've read some of the shopaholic maybe like one or one or two of them I don't know I quite like her. This was a Sophie Kinsella book. So I thought, can't go wrong with that. It'll be something light, easy, breezy to read. I'll probably get through of it in a day or so, whatever. I read this book and I shit you not, I was enraged. I did read it within a day because I didn't want to, I wanted to find out what happened, but I didn't want to waste any more time on it. It infuriated. I was furious. I was so angry. I remember that time wanting to make TikToks about it because I wasn't sure if I wanted to make a main channel video or whatever. I wanted to talk about it and put it out there how like shockingly annoying I thought this book was. But then I just let it gather dust somewhere. No, I did. I never do this. I left it at the hotel because I was like, do you know what? Someone else can go through the drama of reading this absolute dross. I left it there. Not my problem anymore. Washed my hands of it like that bloke did to Jesus that one time. But I just remembered this existed the other day and I thought, a little change of pace from reading bad young adult fiction, whatever. I thought, let's read this bad rom-com together. Let me convince you that this book is infuriating. I don't like the message it puts out there. It's not as egregious as Fifty Shades. What the fuck is as egregious as Fifty Shades? It's not like as damaging as Twilight was glorifying abusive relationships, etc., etc. It's not as offensive. It's, it's not offensive like the House of Night series. I keep feeling like, a <laughs> there we go. <coughs> there it is. It's not like the House of Night series, but it's just, it was really annoying. And what do we call this fiction now, by the way? Because I know that <laughs> chick lit is how you would describe it, but I feel like that's a bit of an archaic term. Maybe it's a little chick lit. Maybe it's a little bit sexist, not sure. What would we call this? I'm just calling this a rom-com. I don't know where the comedy is, but I'm going to call it that. I guess it is woman's fiction, but oh, I don't know. I was baffled, bamboozled, hoodwinked by this book. I think someone says that on TikTok. Here's the premise. The premise is that two people meet at a writer's retreat in Italy and they aren't allowed to know anything about each other because it's part of the retreat. And then after a few days, they decide that they're in love with each other and they don't even know each other's real names or any details about their life. When they get back from the retreat, back to London, they realize that they are completely incompatible. It's the genre, the romance genre, insta love, instant love. Let's get on with it. Chapter one. Do you know what? By chapter two, I'll tell you guys something funny. Also, follow my new Instagram and I might just follow you back. This video is sponsored by NordPass. NordPass is a password manager and cybersecurity tool. With NordPass, you can store all of your passwords in one place, meaning you don't have to memorize all of them. NordPass is simple and easy to use. It's created by the same cybersecurity experts who made NordVPN and is trusted by over 14 million users worldwide. NordPass can help you generate secure passwords. The more complex the passwords, the more your account is protected. NordPass also contains a data breach scanner, which helps you find out if your online accounts or credit details have been leaked. It helps you identify when and where the leak happened and and tells you what type of data was compromised. NordPass is a zero knowledge password manager, which means no one else but you can see what's in your encrypted vault. Not even the NordPass team can. With NordPass, you can save passwords with one click, sign in automatically, import passwords easily, access passwords from your browser, sync passwords across all your devices and have access to online storage. Take care of your digital security today. Save an unlimited number of passwords, automatically save personal information and have secure access to credit cards. Add an extra layer of security to your NordPass vault by setting up a multi-factor authentication, add an OTP generator, or use a Bluetooth device or USB stick to create an extra layer of security for your NordPass vault. Get exclusive access to NordPass's best offers at nordpass.com forward slash Elise, or use code Elise at the checkout to get an additional one month free. 
Thank you, NordPass, for sponsoring today's video. We opened to our narrator complaining about receiving a text from a bloke she went on a bad date with, a date who said nothing the entire evening. Hello, Ava. After consideration, I had decided our relationship is not something I can continue with. Get wrecked. But why does this boring geezer not want a second date? Well, I'm afraid I cannot date anyone who thinks butternut squash soup has a soul. Honestly? Fair enough. I stare at the phone, incensed. He has totally misrepresented me. He hasn't. I did not say butternut squash soup has a soul. I simply said that I thought we should be open-minded about the way this physical and spiritual interlink, which I do. We should. So you said that butternut squash soup has a soul. Main character is insufferable, by the way. That's one of the reasons why this book is bad. Ava, this is the main character, has a dog called Harold, who's a beagle, and a friend called Nell. Ava is dropping Harold off at Nell so she can go to Italy for a week. Here's all his stuff. I dump my massive bag on the floor. Bed, water bowl, blanket, food. Oh, his essential oils. <laughs> I suddenly remember taking the bottle from my bag. I've made him a new blend, lavender and cedar wood. <laughs> yep, that's right, you heard that. She made essential oils for her dog. She is one of those future yummy mummy nutters who lives in Hampstead Heath and regularly posts on Mum's Net. We all live near each other in North London. Told you, she is a future Hampstead Heathian. Ava has two other friends, Sarika and Maud. Sarika is on an expensive dating website called Meet You. I am not talking properly with these in, am I? But what do I want? Enunciation for a two hour video, huh? Or straight teeth? Mm. How does this site work? I say baffled. It starts with all your deal breakers, replies Nell. It shouldn't be called meet you. It should be called sod off you and you and you. There are some good lines in this book from Nell. None of them are from the MC. As she clicks, the photos on the screen start to shimmer. Then one by one, a big red, nope. Then one by one, big red crosses appear in the form of, in fuck off then one by one big red crosses appear in front of faces scattered over the screen i glance at the cute guy and feel a nasty lurch there's a cross in front of his face he looks as though he's been sentenced to execution see what a big baby get a grip i stare at the screen slightly traumatized by this culling process it's brutal i say heartless Open a newspaper read the room ava's deal breakers are people who hate dogs and people who enjoy golf this is reasonable. The girls pontificate about what love actually is. I can't complain about Bechdel tests because this is a rom-com. It's a romantic book. But boy, do I wanna. Ava has a date and has a new theory. After the disastrous date with Seth, I came up with a new theory. It's all in the eyes. I never liked Seth's eyes. That should have told me. So I went online and searched for a guy with gorgeous eyes and found one. I'm actually quite excited. I keep looking at his picture and, f <laughs> I keep looking at his picture and feeling a real connection with him. Yeah, she felt a connection to a bloke's picture from a dating app. Ava is a walking red flag. Nice. Is that all she can say? They're wonderful eyes. They crinkle with warmth and intelligence and wit, even in a tiny photo on a phone. I've never seen such amazing eyes and I've looked at a lot of dating profiles. See, we have a stage five clinger here. This girl goes on one date with you. You're gonna have to call those, um sock people from Monsters Inc, the hazmat ones. Harold steals Sarika's rap and doesn't listen to Ava when he she tells him to drop it because surprise surprise, she has an ineffective dog leader. But this, <laughs> Sophie Kinsella tries to make it come across, a quoss, aqu I've never said that in my life. Are you joking? A quoss, a cross as she's quirky instead of inept and useless. I'm serious about this point too. I know it's a rom-com, but let's shelve that for a moment. If you get a dog, it's important that they look to you as a leader and not for some nonsensical alpha male bullshit bollocks, insecure man thing. Dogs are pack animals. And a dog that knows who he is within the pack hierarchy is a dog that doesn't end up being insecure and potentially causing problems. I haven't researched any of that, but I feel that that's right. If I'm wrong, tell me in the comment section below. Also, a dog needs to respect you enough to listen to you because it will save their life if they're about to run in a road and you tell them to stop and they listen. Ava isn't cute. She's very irresponsible. This is a frequent issue throughout the book. It's part of the climax at the end. So I'm not having to go randomly. Uh, it's just annoying. Maud arrives. Maud has three children and she's always getting everyone to do favors for her. Nell has some, some type of lupus. Nell has some type of lupus that is, lupus. 
It's not the braces doing that to me, surely. That's mysteriously alluded to throughout the book. I think it's lupus or something. It is lupus. She has lupus. Some bloke wants to have a go at Nell, so all of them go outside to argue. He doesn't think that she's actually disabled because she has a chronic invisible illness and it's very infuriating. Don't waste your energy, Maudie, she says a little wearily, then turns to John Sweetman. Fuck off. This is a character who speaks my language. I wish the book was about her. Crisis averted, Ava gets ready for her date. Chapter two. Okay, now I'm sure they're not listening. Do you know what? That was very funny. It's 10 to 11, November 29th. Guess when this video is gonna go live? I have to film and edit this. And I finished I finish the script earlier today. Don't feel pity for me though, this is my fault. This is, it's, it's always my fault. It's my ADHD procrastination. Ava, actually I've been quite good with this one because I was, I was, I wrote most of this script last week. I was just stuck to loads of it. Doesn't matter. You don't care. You don't care about my lack of work schedule process thing. Ava is in Italy complaining about how bad her date was. Open a newspaper, Ava. There's wars going on. Turns out Ava's date had infected eyes recently. So he photoshopped Brad Pitt's eyes onto his for his dating profile. Everyone in this book is like one bad day away from being a serial killer. At the retreat, Ava is with other adult students for the week. The rules at this retreat are no personal clothes, no real name, no phones, no Wi-Fi, etc, etc. It's a millennial's nightmare. Ha ha ha, boomer humor. You know when boomers are like that? You know, like, have you seen those cartoons where a little kid goes outside and it's like, wow, what video game is this? Boomers are literally like, <laughs> that was me knee slapping, I slapped my thigh. Anyway. They get to create new names for themselves for the week, so Ava creatively calls herself Aria. There is a separate martial arts retreat happening next jo jo door, but the instructor is, mm, is sick. So three of the members of that class choose to join the writing retreat instead, and in walks our love interest. He is super dreamy, of course, and he chooses the name Dutch. It was the name my childhood dog, he says as he introduces himself, and I melt. His voice is good. It's... <laughs> It's deep and resonant and ambitious and honest, but noble and humorous too, with a hint of past sadness, but rays of future sunshine and a thread of rare intelligence. And okay, I know I've only heard him utter eight words, but that's enough. I can tell, I can feel it. I just know he has a big heart and integrity and honor. He would never Photoshop in, in Brad Pitt's eyes. You idiot. Chapter three. But speaking of Christmas and Christmas presents, I have new merch now. Over at my site, ayclothing.tmail.com, it is 20% off of everything that I am I can, because you can't do discount codes. I manually decreased everything by 20%, but some things like the jigsaw puzzle, that was already at the lowest amount that Tmail would allow, so I couldn't apply a discount to that. But we have a new festive edition of the Die Cry Hate line. We have new jumpers, a hoodie, tote bags, and a jigsaw puzzle. It's the perfect Christmas gift for any Scrooges in your life. Or if you have to wear Christmas jumpers to work, oh, buy one of mine. Get your point across. The 20% discount is for Black Friday and will be applicable for up to a week. And then it's business as usual. And the normal Die Cry Hate limited edition t-shirt is finally going to be taken down so it can make way for more limited editions. So if you've wanted one, you better snap it up whilst the sale is on because once it's gone, it's probably touch wood never coming back. So go to my clothing store, ayclothing.tmall.com and cop yourself some new merch. Dutch and Ava talk during a break. There's a girl from the martial arts place called Lyric who fancies Dutch, but he's not bothered. She's so after him. As we take our seats, I sneak a few glances at her and she's gazing at Dutch in an unmistakable look in her eye. It's so blatant, so obvious. I mean, it's inappropriate, if you ask me. This is a writing retreat. You were just ear fucking the sound of his voice, you hypocrite. The issue with Ava is that she doesn't grow at all over the story. Um, no, I'm wrong. She grows infinitesimal amounts at the end and then it's eradicated. <laughs> she remains immature and ridiculous, manic pixie dream girl esque which only a few people can pass off like me i'm not like a dream girl i'm like a manic pixie hate g manic pixie manic demon hell girl and 
I'm sure a few people can. The only one that really springs to mind who I like is Zoe Deschanel. Anyway, as Kurt carries on his tirade, I find my gaze drifting back to Lyric. She's still gazing at Dutch, her mouth half open. She's fixated. It's unhealthy. Plus her Kurt pajama top is hanging sexily off one shoulder. Don't tell me that happened by accident no self-awareness. The class has to do an improvisation scene individually. Someone steals stuff from Star Trek and Dutch does a short and rubbish monologue about how someone is making him mad. The other martial arts students decide to leave and get a refund but Dutch stays. One of Ava's issues, not one of my criticisms, one of her issues in the story is she's a complete flake. She only ever half starts things, she never finishes them. This month she's decided to be a writer, hence the retreat. Wait, why do I feel like I'm attacking myself there? Oh, she's decided to be a writer but doesn't write. No, I can't think of who that reminds me of. Uh, I take a sip of wine, playing for time. The truth is, I haven't given my book a thought. I'm obsessed by Dutch. <sighs> Look at the story we studied today, book lover is saying, dunking her bread into artichoke dip. If that's not about trying again, but they don't try again, author to be interrupts. That's it, finito. I think we had to believe they might reconcile, chimes in Austin shyly. Isn't that what love is? Forgiveness? But there's a limit, offered to be turns to Dutch. What about you, Dutch? Are you a forgiving type? Do you believe in second chances? This feels like a premonition for this entire book. That's just how I am. Dutch breaks off and his face suddenly lights up as though he's spotted someone he knows. Hey, beautiful. My throat seizes up. Beautiful? Who's beautiful? Who just arrived? His wife? His Italian girlfriend? The waitress he somehow already started a relationship with this afternoon without me noticing? Ridiculous. Have I been in a situation where I've just randomly met a guy and thought they're attractive and wondered if they were single but then they slip in a oh yeah my girlfriend uh. yeah of course who hasn't but then you feel momentarily deflated and get the fuck over it because you only just met this person there's eight billion other people on this planet and you don't even know this person anyway so who cares am i cold or is ava ridiculous dutch was talking to a random dog which is the biggest green flag you can get to be fair. Chapter four. I'm slightly wishing I looked more Italian right now. All the Italian staff at the retreat have such glossy dark hair and smooth olive skin, whereas my skin freckles in the sun. I'm what they call fine featured, which can seem like an asset until you see a luscious 19 year old with blunt bobbed hair and a snub nose and rounded dimpled shoulders? Luscious? If you have teen in your age, then you might as well still be in a cradle. Calm down, Ava. Ava is still obsessing over Dutch instead of bothering to write about her book. So at this point, I was like, hmm, I wonder how much a writing retreat costs. I think she only goes for five days. So I googled and they cost at least a grand. She spent a grand on this and is wasting it chasing after some dude. However, Dutch is interested in Ava back, somehow. Must be her winning personality. He invites her on a car drive to explore the area. The next afternoon, they drive around together, expensive retreat be damned. How do I find myself being driven through gorgeous Italian scenery, the sun blazing down, the radio playing next to the most perfect guy in the world? Steady on, pal, you've only just met. They decide to do a Bella Swan and cliff dive, unfortunately not to their doom. They survive and almost kiss, and Ava wants to know, what does it mean? <laughs> My question is, just now in the water, I felt we might be going in a certain direction. I forced myself to meet his gaze full on, and I'm interested in, in where? You've known him for a day, calm down, love. They have a snog and spend the afternoon together. Then they play with rocks. Sounds like stuff Zoella would do for fun. Dutch joins in with a football game. He seems to understand what the teenagers are yelling, even though they're speaking Italian. I guess they're all communicating in the international language of football. When one of the players slams into him with an aggressive tackle, Dutch brushes off his apology with an easygoing nod. He has a natural authority too, I notice. The kids are deferring to him, even when they're challenging him. Everything is another clue to who he is. Everything is another insight. This annoyed me. I'm not really sure why. It's kind of like how Bella speaks of Edward or how Trish speaks of four. Oh, he's a natural authority. Like, sh go, get, look, stop. Why are you psychoanalyzing him? He's just trying to play football. Calm down, Freud. No, Freud, Freud. Freud, dude. Then that's not how you pronounce it. So it's Freud, doid. Ava wishes she could take the rocks that they've been playing with home with her. I wish I could hit you over the head with one. Dutch takes Ava to get pizza, but two teenagers appear and pull a knife out on them, which is a bit random, bit quirky. Ooh, dangerous. Luckily, Dutch uses the power of martial arts and the teenagers run away. They go back to the retreat and have sex. It's implied there's no actual sex scene. It's not graphic. Boo. Chapter five, Ava sneaks off to alert her friends about the new bloke via WhatsApp. They're all online, I realize. We are all permanently 
online. Offline doesn't exist anymore. There's no offline button on things. The girls are all excited, but Ava can't answer any of their questions because she knows nothing of this guy. She does not even know his real name. The woman smiles and I smile back, taking in her ancient lined face and thinking both, she looks so wise and oops, I forgot to put on sunscreen. Bit patronizing, isn't it? Well, just because she's old, she's wise. Doubt it. Mate, there's loads of boomers. These braces are annoying me. They're impacting my ability to do anything. Ava's friends try to bring her back down to earth. So it's just sex. I stare at the phone, feeling nettled at Maud's comment. First of all, what's that supposed to mean? Just sex. Sex with the right person is transcendental. It informs you about a person's soul. Someone who is generous in bed is going to be generous in real life. And anyway, it's not just sex. I know Dutch. I've built a pebble tower with him. I've seen him play football with kids. I've leapt off rocks with him. That's what's important. Not what does he do, but would you leap off a rock with him? Pretty sure knowing someone's name also does help. Ava tells her friends that he saved her from an attack. A knife attack? What the fuck is going on out there? Ava, stay safe. I think you should come home. These are all totally real <laughs> reasonable responses. Back in the retreat, Ava writes a sex scene for her story. He transported her. He intoxicated her. The touch of his fingers set her on fire. The sound of his voice made her head spin. Everything else in life seemed irrelevant. Who cared what job he had or what his name was? Wait. This isn't Clara I'm writing about, this is me. We are 70 pages in at this point and this lady thinks about herself way too much. They have to read out their scenes in class so Ava goes first. You are my wife, growled Chester, and I claim my conjugal rights. This is an outdated practice, snapped Clara, the fire of feminism in her eyes. I foresee that in future generations, women will be equal. Don't give up the day job, mate. The sweat of shame passed over Chester's brow. You are right, he said. I will join the fight, Clara. In future years, I will be a male suffragette. But then Chester could hold back his throbbing desire no longer. As he ripped off Clara's bodice, bodice, whatever, he moaned like a, I hesitate, a helioporous, airy, airy frog, airy. Mm -hmm. Ava makes a lot of continuity errors about her own story and she's called out on it by the other students. Dutch goes next and he has also written a sex scene. They fucked. As his voice rings through the space, there's a jolt of slight surprise. That is bold, murmurs book lover next to me as Dutch continues. It was incredible. She was hot. She was loud. Louder than he'd expected. It was intense. Afterwards, they drank wine and ate grassini. <sighs> Idiots. Everyone works out that they shagged. Chapter shit. Six, six, chapter six. Ava is mad at Dutch for all of five sentences, but gets over it because he's like so sexy and dreamy. It's real. What we have feels, I hesitate, because is this too much? Too soon? Yes, but I can't stop myself. You might just think this is a holiday fling. My voice trembles a little, but I think, I already feel like it's more. All right, calm down, she's keen, Jesus. They agreed to keep in the bubble for as long as possible, but Ava makes sure that Dutch likes dogs first. Just the idea of Dutch meeting Harold floods me of emotion, my two centers of love, together. Wait, do I mean love? I've only just met Dutch. Am I using the word love even in my thoughts? I wouldn't have a problem with this story if it was about how stupid it is to think you're in love with someone you've known for 48 hours and when you don't even know anything about him, but it's not about that. This story is about no matter how incompatible you are and how miserable you're making each other, it's better to stay with someone and pretend that things will work out and I'm not even being facetious. Maybe a little bit. Come on, be honest. There is only one word for what I'm feeling right now. I love him. I don't know anything about this guy. How is this not satire? Not his age, not his job, not even his name. But I love him. Gets oxytocin sh- Nope. Gets oxy- Nope. Gets oxy- t Gets oxytocin- Gets oxy- Gets oxy- Gets oxytocin rush from hand- Nope. Gets oxytocin- Gets oxytocin rush from having a good shag once. Was it worth it? Probably not. By Friday, everyone sees them as a couple. It's the night before they leave and everyone is playing guess the real name, except for Ava because she is so up her own ass she can't remember her real name. Fair enough, author to be twinkles at me. I'm not above a bit of role play myself. I stare at him in indignation. Role play? This isn't role play. It's real, connected, love. It's insufferable is what it is. And anyway, the truth is I have a fair idea about Dutch already. I'm pretty intuitive, not psychic exactly, but I pick things up. I have a sensitive radar. Oh my God, 
I'm getting chills. I made myself a phone. <laughs> Salad of charisma. <laughs> she is one Shane Dawson video away from calling herself an empath. Ava reckons that Dutch is actually a carpenter called Sean Luke. The others reckon that Ava and Dutch are just going to be a holiday fling. So, okay, you guys win, he says in his easy way, looking around the expectant faces. You've got to me. I never thought about romance till I came on this course. I never thought about love. But now, it's all I can think about. Because... I love this woman, he turns to me, not just for the week, not just as a holiday fling, but for keeps. Screaming, crying, perfect storm. I can make all the tables turn. Dutch, I start again, trying to ignore the tear that has edged onto my cheek. I came on this course to learn about writing fictional love, fantasy love, but I found the real thing. I squeeze his hands tight. Right here, the real thing. My voice is starting to tremble. Right here. The real thing. My voice has started to tremble. <laughs> Giving Matt Berry a run for his money. Matt Berry. Yes, farmer. But I force myself to continue. And I want to pledge to you, Dutch, that no matter what your real name is, no matter what you do, no matter where you live in the world, we'll make this work. Rose garden filled with fawns. They're interrupted by a bloke giving out taxi vouchers to Heathrow for the pair of them. Dutch and I stare at each other, taking in this thunderbolt. Heathrow. He throw. I'm stunned. In fact, I'm almost let down because I'd imagined romantically battling the odds of a long distance relationship. Yeah, it's almost like you love the idea of a relationship with this guy <laughs> rather than the reality. I might pull them out and teeth in a minute. Chapter seven. They are on the plane home. A few of us from the course are on the plane or scattered around. Dutch has been seated four rows ahead of me, but that's fine. We don't need to sit together. We've got the rest of our lives to be together. <laughs> Do you know how unhinged this is? Ava's squad randomly meets her at the airport. The only thing is, they seem to be a bit involved in some sort of scuffle. Harold is snarling at uniform chauffeur and biting at his legs while Bertie tries to haul him off. If this was real life, this dog would have been put down already from biting someone they weren't meant to and it would have been all Ava's fault. As it always is. Not Ava's fault. People who don't train the bloody dogs properly and then the dog has to suffer. Ugh! Get that dog off me, the chauffeur is exclaiming furiously. Take off your hat then, Bertie retorts insolently. Harold doesn't like your hat, it's not his fault. Children should be seen and not heard, snaps the chauffeur lividly. Ah, you really got the most out of this writer's retreat, huh? Exclaiming furiously, retorts insolently, snaps lividly. Stephen King said, try to use less lees and sometimes said is fine. Will you stop that dog? Seen and not heard, Nell instantly squares up to him. You want to silence children? Maybe you want to silence women too. What's your fucking problem? That is quite the leap in logic. I appreciate it. Dutch is baffled by the scene. It turns out the chauffeur is Dutch's driver. My brain seems to be short-circuiting. Don't take much. This is all wrong. Carpenters don't have drivers. What's going on? What's going on is your parents used the soft part of your skull as a beer can holder when you were a baby, you nitwit. It takes me a moment to realize that Dutch is even looking at Harold. He's addressing the chauffeur in irritable tones. I've never even heard him sound irritable before. Yeah, well, a week ago, you'd never heard the sound of his voice, so. Dutch has to leave because of a work thing, but this doesn't change anything. I love you. I love you too. I swallow hard so much. I know this is its own genre insta love love at first sight which i don't believe in i think you can have lust and infatuation at first sight love perhaps not then you know you go on a few dates with someone you shag them for a bit you decide to be exclusive you turn to boyfriend girlfriend love develops i don't believe in that thing i think it's yeah whatever but at least in all those other stories of instant love you'd have thought the characters would know basic details about each other by now not these two they are in love with idealized holiday versions of themselves they're just in lust dutch is in a family company that makes dolls houses he almost leaves without them exchanging numbers which would have been great because then the book would have been cut short dutch's real name is matt slash matthias or Matthias, whatever. He closes the window again and I watch the car move off, my mind turning over this new information. Matt. Matthias. Dolls houses. Dolls houses? Matt Warwick. Matt. Meet my boyfriend. Matt. Hi. This is Matt. Have you met Matt? Have you met Ted? It feels right. It feels familiar. I think I knew he was called Matt all along. Yes. Chapter eight. It's the next day. My body has actually been pining for him. I don't want to sound overdramatic, but he's crystal meth. 
in a good way. My physiology has changed. I can never not be with him again. I guarantee that she has never even done care. As I see him emerging from the tube station, I feel such relief and exhilaration I could almost burst into tears, mixed up with a sudden shyness. Because here's this weird thing. This guy in his black jeans, his grey t-shirt, isn't Dutch. He's Matt. Matt with his driver and his job and his life. And I don't really know Matt. Not yet. He looks a little trepidatious too. And we laugh awkwardly as he nears me. Here's the thing. I have very little issues with Sophie Kinsella's writing abilities. Do I just repeat myself all the time because i already said this but i don't remember writing this but i said it at the beginning of this video it's not like twilight where stephanie mayer thinks a plot is a conspiracy to baffle your reader to death with or 50 shades of gray where el james has never looked up the definition of a subconscious before what lets kinsella down in this book is the two main characters because there is good writing and insight when the characters aren't busy being ridiculously incompatible with each other as i say the words i have a sudden and mad flashback to sarika's deal breaker and imagine matt replying severely well as long as it's not more than 10 minutes the very thought makes me want to laugh it just shows how messed up modern love has become deal breakers are wrong deal breakers are anti-love if you ask me deal breakers are the work of the devil deal breakers are usually reasonable boundaries to prevent you from compromising on what you want out of this lifetime dumb dumb saying all that stuff before though matt's family owns harriet's house which is the aforementioned doll's house and doll figures apparently that's a harriet house theme park in dubai singapore they want to open up one in japan later on there's also, later on in the book, there's these conventions and the people there are treated like rock stars. This could have a real life equivalent that I'm unaware of, but it does seem a little bit OTT. I tried to Google it. I don't think there's a permanent Barbie world theme park anywhere in the, like a permanent one. So hmm. as we approach my house, I feel prickles of excitement. I'm so proud of where I live. I've decorated and furnished it with love. I've been creative with my ideas and really pushed myself. Nothing's bland. <sighs> Harold is excited to see them again. Sorry, I say, smiling apologetically over his head at Matt. We have this routine when I come home. I missed you, I address Harold lovingly and kiss his head. I missed you. I missed you. I'm holding Harold's paws and waltzing round of him and I suddenly wish Matt was in on this with us. Join in, I say invitingly and extend a hand to him, but Matt gives us a slightly frozen smile. I love dogs more than I tolerate people and I'll still run a mile away from this. It's good, he says. I'm good. Were you out all day or something? No, I say over my shoulder. I just popped to the tube to meet you. Right, Matt seems baffled. So you do this dance every time you come home? Yeah, she's been teaching the dog separation anxiety. Isn't that fun and quirky and cute? She shows him around. That's my rescue yucca. I beam at him. Rescue yucca? I found it in a skip. These people are just thrown it out. I can't help sounding indignant. A living plant. They shouldn't be allowed to have plants. So I thought I'll give you a home. Lovely. I touch its leaves affectionately. And now it's thriving. So anyway, come and have a drink. Ava has a very colorful and bright apartment, which Matt clearly doesn't like, but he's just being polite to her. He inspects her books. Cheers, he swigs his beer, then adds, The Chevrolet, A Guide, published 1942. Seriously? And this one's in, he pulls out a hardback. What language is this? Czech? Do you read Czech? A lot of these books I didn't exactly buy to read, I clarify. I suppose they're like rescue books. Rescue books? Matt looks dumbfounded. Sometimes I go into a junk shop and if I see an old book and it speaks to me, I think if I don't buy this book, no one will. And then it'll be destroyed. It'll be pulped. I feel as though it's like my responsibility to buy them. I run a sweeping hand along my bookshelf. These would all be pulped if I hadn't rescued them. Oh, Matt swigs his beer. Would that matter? I stare at him in shock. Would that matter? For the first time ever, I feel a tiny tension between us because what kind of person doesn't care about the plight of books? How quirky, Ava rescues books from shops that people don't want to read. You could just give them to charity shops. Okay. Ava's like Phoebe Buffay, but really annoying. At least Phoebe Buffay was quite sweet in the first few seasons. Sit down, let's have some music. Smiling at Matt, I find my favourite playlist on my phone and hook it up to my Buddha speakers. I sit next to Matt on the sofa and sip my drink contentedly as the music fills the room. Then I blink. Did Matt just wince? No, he couldn't have winced. No one winces at music, especially music as relaxing as this. What is this? He says after a pause. It's called Mexican spirit power music, I explain eagerly. They use special pipes and flutes. It's guaranteed to calm you. 
This is a person with zero self-awareness of how she's coming across to others. Faux excitement and positivity for everything. Matt is into Japanese punk, so at least that's relatable to me. Matt is confused about a poster with some nonsensical quote on it and Ava feels annoyed by him. I'm feeling a weird emotion rising inside me. Is it annoyance? No, it can't be annoyance. Of course it's not. This is Dutch. This is Matt. This is my love. Ava is very open-minded as she keeps telling us, except when she's presented with people who don't see the world exactly as she does. Come here, I say, and pull him in for a kiss. And as soon as I do, I forget I ever felt even a smidgen of annoyance with him because, oh God, I love this man. I want to kiss him forever. I want to be with him forever. I think you're just horny forever. As Matt disappears into the loo, I take the opportunity to whip out my phone because I promise to let the squad know how it's going and frankly, I'm looking forward to telling them it's all going brilliantly. She has no self-awareness. They've all been so cynical, so negative, especially Nell who keeps saying, but you don't know him. Even Maud, who is generally a very positive person, said, Ava, you need to stop using the word love. You don't love this man. You don't know enough about him to love him. And Sarika predicted he would ghost me. Why are they friends of her? They probably just laugh at her escapades behind their back behind her back. All wonderful, A plus date, we're 100% compatible, which is true, we are. Apart from a couple of minute details like the Japanese punk, but that makes us 99.9% .9 compatible and I'm rounding up. How do I get a restraining order against this book? Here's something I did like recently. Recently I went to this live show of, okay, so there was this satire channel four show for one season called Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. And the guy who wrote Darth Marenghi, the character is named Matthew Holness. And this came out like years and years ago. Richard Iwadi was in it, Matt Berry was in it. But Matthew Holness recently came out with a book in the character of, cause Garth Marenghi, the character, he's this horror writer and it's sort of to satirize like pulp horror of the eighties and stuff, you know, Stephen King-esque. Matthew Holness, he recently wrote a book in the voice of Garth Marenghi. And he did a live show where he was reading, so, and he stayed in character as Garth Marenghi the whole time, which I was I was actually blown away by how, like, because he did this whole Q and A section and it was so good and people were asking questions and they had funny questions, but the answers he was come up with, they were all funny whilst he was staying in character. And I feel like that's, I, I won't, I'm not very good at improvising. I wouldn't be able to do something like that, you know? So I bought the audio book because Matthew Holness narrates it in the voice of Garth Marenghi as well. And it's really funny. And I think I just mentioned that because A, that is something that I've liked recently and I never talk about stuff that I like. Cause do you know what? If you talk about stuff you like on YouTube, it doesn't actually do that well. People, people, you know, for all the people on the internet that said, oh, well wait, spread hate and stuff. And like, I agree. Don't be like needlessly bullying or whatever. Well, I'd be negative online. People like that. People like it when you sit there and slag off something popular, someone popular, this type of thing. If I did a video like dissecting a book I really like, <laughs> Just wouldn't like no one would watch it and two but that makes us 99% compatible and i'm rounding up sounds like a line from one of his books the it's it's, it's called garth Marenghi's terror Tome, and it is so funny it's so he's so intelligent and you can you can really tell how smart he is by his i'm in awe you know sometimes when i see a really really funny good like a really funny good show i feel like, a bit depressed afterwards like my god why am i not doing more of my life Oh good, but I could never be a Matthew Horness or a Rich Liawadi. So really, why bother? Could be a Russell Brand. Could be a Noel Fielding. But I'd never be a Rich Liawadi. Why do I get out of bed in the morning? That's what I'm asking. Anyway, Matt tells her her back doors are soft. From dry rot. And the glass isn't secure. And it's been like that forever, I smile at him. It's fine. Isn't that a security risk, he says, undeterred. You should get someone to look at that or replace it with double glazing. Double glazing? Replace my quirky original door with double glazing? The most unbelievable part is that we're meant to believe a woman this naive and daft lives in London just fine and hasn't been robbed a million times yet. Matt doesn't know what harissa is and he eats meat. I'm stirring my tagine in agitation, my face hot. How can he not be vegetarian? I almost feel like he fooled me. He deceived me. It's not the end of the world, I tell myself desperately. It's just, oh God, it was all so perfect. Calm down, love, you're just a vegetarian. No offense to any vegetarians who are watching this, especially if you're in my audience. This is, you're wonderful. This is just for the benefit of this character. I'm a level five vegan 
who doesn't eat anything that casts a shadow. Where do you think the cows go once all the precious milk and cheese has been wrung out of them? I focus on the stove anew. Oh right, that's why he got confused. Actually, that's quite funny. I'm so used to Harold's food by now, I almost blank it out. It's for Harold, I explain. He follows a special canine organic diet. I know some dogs are vegetarian, but I went to a consultant and Harold has quite specific dietary needs. At the very least, she isn't one of the ones who forces a lifestyle choice on her dog. It's a lamb bone, I explain. I'm going to use the broth to make up his week's food. Wow, Matt seems fixated by the bubbling meaty liquid. It looks good. Really good. Could I taste it? Out of nowhere, I feel a sudden flare of indignation. Before I can stop myself, I snap. Are you saying the dog's food looks better than what I've cooked for you? To be fair, that is proper rude. What he just said that he'd prefer the dog's dinner to her, I'm sure, lovely vegetable tagine. We should be rooting for these characters, but I'm just rooting for both of them to block each other. I show Matt where the cutlery lives and as he's gathering knives and forks, I take a few deep breaths. Then I ask in the most super casual tones I can muster. So, Matt, do you think you could ever be vegetarian? Just dump him, move on. Already my stomach has relaxed. There we are, it's all fine. Never say never, that's all I needed to know. I can see I've overreacted. In fact, it's all very clear to me. I'll convert him. The vegetarian gods have sent him to me for this very purpose. The vegetarian gods are too busy eating cheese to notice you. I pass him a bowl of posh crisps, which I bought especially for tonight, and Matt takes a couple. But before they can get to his mouth, Harold appears from nowhere, adeptly leaps onto the bench, removes the crisps from Matt's hands and crunches them. He jumps down and scoots away while I try not to laugh, and Matt gazes at him in astonishment. Did he just take that out of my hand? I didn't even notice him. He's pretty deft, I grin. You have to hold food at chest level or else vamus. I'm expecting Matt to laugh, but he still looks astonished, even disapproving. Ava finds this funny because she doesn't understand that her dog has zero respect for her. I don't believe him, but nor do I want to force the issue. So in bright tones, I say, glass of wine and fetch a bottle I bought in Italy. Just the glug, glug, glug sound soothes away whatever tension was in the air. He's the perfect bloke. Just as long as you constantly drink alcohol to put up with him. They only get on when they are snogging. All of Ava's furniture is upcycled, aka found in skips. Not your bed, surely, he says, looking slightly repulsed. Especially my bed. I found it in a skip, I say proudly. Maud painted it and it's as good as new. I just hate new furniture. It's so blah. It's so functional. It has no character. It also doesn't have bed bugs or termites, but who cares about hygiene, am I right? Matt's chair breaks down because it's upcycled and he falls to the floor. Wordlessly, Matt pulls up his sleeve to reveal a horrible gash which has gone right through his shirt. Shit, my stomach is hollow. Shit, but how? What? Nail. He points at a huge rusty nail sticking out of my salvaged kitchen dresser, which is also on Maud's upcycling list. Must have caught me when I went down. New furniture also probably won't give you tetanus. Fun fact, I need to get my tetanus shot. <laughs> because when we were meant to get them in secondary school, I think I forgot to give the form to my parents for them to sign off on it. So when it came to tetanus shot day, me and one of my friends couldn't get our shots. <laughs> I remember the lady just being like, oh, well, you two won't be laughing when you've got tetanus. I've been living dangerously ever since then and I keep forgetting to just, and I'll, I just keep forgetting. Sue me, remind me. Like video by video, remind me, Elise, have you had your tetanus shot yet? Matt goes to the hospital. Successful first dates always end with one person at the hospital. Don't stress, shit happens, he squeezes my arm again. And apart from that, it's been a great evening, he adds. Really? It has. Thank you. I loved the, um, what part of it? They don't see eye to eye on anything. Ava goes with him to a &E. Chapter nine. The next day, Ava is taking Harold with her to spend the night at Matt's. I was wrong about what I said in the previous chapter. The most unrealistic part of this is that Matt didn't run for the fucking hills after that disastrous first date and leave her and read or ghost her. I cannot suspend my disbelief that much. They live in London. People have been blocked for far less. We start walking and I look around with bright eyes because this is Matt's neighborhood. This is a part of him. And it's a glorious area of London, one pretty street after another. And look, a garden square. My fingers are crossed that he lives in a square just like this and has a key to the garden. I can see us lying on the grass in the sunshine, lazily scratching Harold's head and drinking wine and just enjoying life forever. Bailiff's in the Tory part. Ava spends the entire time at A&E only talking about herself to Matt. Her mum died when she was 16 and her dad is distant and lives in Hong Kong. Ava has some sort of freelance job. 
and she always forgets to receive her payments from her invoices. So I'm not that convinced that she could afford rent in North London, but anyway. So now it's time for me to hear about his background. I want to learn all about his parents, their lovable quirks, their heartwarming traditions, the important lessons they've given him as he's grown up. Basically, I want to learn why I'm going to love them. She is so incredibly presumptuous. I want to be sick. Nell once said to me, Ava, you don't have to be ready to love anything and everything you come across, but she was exaggerating. I don't. And anyway, this isn't anything. This is Matt. I love him and I'm ready to love his family too. You don't even know them or him for that matter. If you love absolutely everything, then do you really love anything at all? Isn't love a type of exclusivity, a type of separation? Oh my God, I'm so brilliant. I'm just dazzled by my own brilliance issues, Jesus. I love my friend. Why did I write that? No, I don't. I love my friends because they're special to me. I don't love a random stranger on the street because I don't know them. Ava is superficial. All Matt says about his family is that his parents are tall. <laughs> he has no personality. It don't get better. And so I don't see what she sees him in the first place apart from he's fit. That's all it ever boils down to. As long as the bloke is fit, who cares if he has the personality of a teaspoon? No, no, he has the personality of a cat litter tray. <laughs> they arrive at his, actually, that was improv just then, the cat litter tray line. No, uh, I couldn't do a Garth Marenghi though. I'm not being paid by him, but I think people should genuinely like check out Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, check out his show, that's it. They arrive, <laughs> so he's not really done much else. They arrive at his house and she hates it. What I honestly think is, I can't believe anyone ever designed this or built it. It's made of concrete with sinister looking circular windows and odd rectangular structures extending in all directions. There are three blocks in total, linked by concrete walkways and stairways and weird angular bits. As I look up, I can see a distant high up face peering out of a glass stairwell as though in prison. But then I feel guilty for having critical thoughts. London's a nightmare to find a home in. It's not Matt's fault that this is all he could find. See, she's so judgmental, but calls herself open minded. It's a great example of 1960s brutalism, he adds with enthusiasm. This is a very specific architectural style. So I suppose you could debate that it is art. And Ava claims to be an artist, but really she just likes flowery things, that's it. They go inside, Ava hates Matt's art. It's an eyeless face made from clay straining out of a panel on a long neck as though it wants to scream or eat me. It's the most grotesque, creepy thing I've ever seen. In revulsion, I swivel away to see a similar piece of ours on the adjacent wall. Only this is 10 hands all reaching out to me like something from a nightmare. Who makes this? I reach down to Harold for some reassurance and say, isn't this great, Harold? She is insufferable. In my peripheral vision, I can see yet another sculpture which seems to depict a raven. Okay, I can cope with a raven. I walk up to it. Good, they're well smart. Intending to, say, they can learn like up to 500 words. They can learn more words than parrots can and crows. And they hold grudges against people. So if you're nasty to them, not only will, will they hold grudges, they will also tell their little crow mates about you. So if you're nasty to them, watch out, you're gonna get pelted by stuff, by bird shit. I walk up to it, intending to say something complimentary, then notice that in the raven's mouth, there are human teeth. I emit a scream before I can stop myself, then clap a hand over my mouth. Imagine being this soft. Ava meets Matt's roommates, Nihal and Topher. Topher stops punching and turns to face us and I feel an inner jolt. Whereas Nihal is skinny and quite conventional looking, Topher is arresting. He's powerfully built with a face which is, well, I don't like to use the word ugly, but he's ugly. So ugly, he comes almost full circle. His eyes are sunk into his face. His dark eyebrows are massive. His skin is bad, yet somehow he's compelling. He radiates personality, even standing there all sweaty in his sports shorts. She is so rude. He's so ugly that actually makes him sort of attractive, but it doesn't really because he looks like the missing link. I set out Harold's bed and blanket and spritz everything with essential oils. As Matt enters holding a glass of wine and beer, I exclaim, all ready for the sleepover. In my family, dogs aren't allowed in the bedroom, responds Matt, and I laugh because he has a really dry sense of humour. Then, as I stand up and see his frown, my heart plunges. That wasn't humour. He means it. He means it? Harold always sleeps in the same room as me, I explain, trying to hide my rising anxiety. He'll get lonely if he doesn't. I'm sure he'll be fine in the kitchen, says Matt, as though I haven't spoken. We can put his bed there. He'll be very comfortable, won't you, Harold? This comes down to personal preference. However, I think if your dog is trained and which chew stuff up as you're sleeping, you know, you can trust them to put around by themselves. I see no issues with dogs sleeping in the same room as you. As a pack in the wild, they will sleep together to guard each other. If you've had a dog sleep in a separate room their whole life, that is okay too, as that's what they would be used to. Dogs love routine. Harold 
is so used to being with Ava. So Matt is being pig-headed and really rude here. In fact, if they actually went through with upsetting the dog's routine and putting Harold in the kitchen, they'd have gotten no sleep anyway as Harold would probably whine, cry, destroy things, chew things in the kitchen from stress, anxiety, whatever. Dump him. Matt, not Harold. Why should a bloke you've known for a week come before the routine you've set with your dog? Dump a bullet fence, prioritize, and always, if you have pre-existing pets, always prioritize. If you get pets with someone, you like, you can't just get animals and then like just chuck them away when you want. Matt realizes it's non-negotiable though and gives him. Matt offhandedly mentions a Genevieve and both of them act like children. Cool, Matt nods. That's where Genevieve always used to. He stops himself and there's a prickly silence during which my mind was. There was a Genevieve? Of course there was a Genevieve. Of course he has a past. We're grown-ups. We both have pasts. The real question is, what do we want to know about this past? Matt has been darting where he looks at me and now he draws breath. Both of these people are in their 30s. I don't need to know anything about Genevieve, I say, trying to emphasize the point. I'm not interested in Genevieve. Couldn't care less. And you don't need to know about Russell. Russell? Mass difference. Who the hell is Russell? I don't know, Russell Brand. I'm already getting used to the black, but maybe I could suggest a few brighter accessories to cheer up. Yes, like a fro. He needs some throwing cushions. She is so obnoxious. I'm open-minded, except if anyone likes anything different from me ever. You know that main characters are meant to be likable. Yeah. Topher seems try hard at first for no reason. I have unfashionable emotions, melancholy, envy, wrath, schadenfreude. He types something in a sudden energetic flurry. Plus, you know, I'm a bastard. <laughs> IT crowds, I'm a bastard. Yep, that's me, just a bastard. I can't do an accent. I'm sure you're not. Well, I am, I mean spirited. I don't give money to beggars and the streakers, or I'm a bastard. That went that bad, it wasn't bad in my head. You started a charity, observes Nahal, walking past on the way to his desk. Topher talks bullshit, he adds to me. Don't ever listen to him. I started a charity to meet girls, says Topher without missing a beat. Girls love charity. I bet you love charity, Ava. He glances up at me with his deep set eyes. Of course you do. Oh, charity, I just love charity. Let's have sex because you gave a fuckload of cash to charity. Okay. I run polls. Topher gestures at the free computers on his desk. Opinion polls. I gather viewpoints, crunch numbers, and tell politicians and companies what people think. And it's not pretty. Humans are terrible. But you probably knew that. Humans aren't terrible, I reply indigently. I know he's joking. I think he's joking. But I still feel the need to put in a more positive viewpoint. You shouldn't go around saying humans are terrible. It's too depressing. You have to think positive. No, he is right and based. Come on. You're a vegetarian. I'm sure you've seen videos of abattoirs. Come on. I have the data. He pats one of his computers. Humans are weak, hypocritical, sanctimonious, inconsistent. I'm ashamed of humans. I include myself, naturally. Nihal, are you going to load up the fucking robot or what? I take it all back. Topher is the best character in this book. I write pharmaceutical copy for a company called Breaksons, I explain. They make drugs and medical supplies. She does have a job. Matt is stressed from work, but won't talk to Ava about it because he is one of those love interests. The annoying ones who never show any personality nor want to talk about anything substantial, yet the heroine inexplicably falls in love with them. But Ava sees that Matt plays golf, one of her cardinal sins. As I watch, aghast, he gets out a couple of golf balls. I don't like football, football culture, football fans, football hooligans, the football itself. But if my partner started kicking around a ball in the garden, I wouldn't sit there shell-shocked by it. It's a bizarre reaction. I might join him. Matt's entire family is obsessed with golf. I swivel around and scream before I can stop myself. He's holding a white platter on which are four red, <laughs> raw, quivering steaks. Why are they quivering? Like, is he shaking them? I can smell their odious, fleshy smell. I can see the blood oozing from them. Steak night, Topher elaborates. Choose your cup. You'd like it rare, I assume. Could you? Could you possibly move that away from me? I manage, almost wanting to hurt. Oh, God, she's one of them. Good Lord, grow up. I bet she goes to the, you know, the, uh, the raw meat section of the supermarket. I bet she goes there and cries, God. I manage, almost wanting to tell. Oh, Ava's vegetarian, says Matt, lining up his shop. I should have mentioned. Vegetarian, Topher says, stopped at his tracks. This was, like, not... This was written recently, I think. Vegetarianism is not a far out concept. Needs veganism. It's been around in certain cultures for thousands of years. But the, why, why are they why are they acting so shocked about vegetarianism? And there's like mentions of, right, when did this book come out? 
sorry this came out in 2020 people are very aware of vegetarians people are very aware of tofu 2020 like veganism had a big boom about four years ago and then we got greg's vegan sausage rolls this is this is unrealistic they live in london and they're acting as though they've never even like heard of vegetarian and there's lots of bits like that sophie kinsella you realize that like vegetarianism is quite mainstream and a lot of pubs that you go into in england now have vegan options and vegan beers and stuff you know this isn't like a far out concept to anyone oh god i'm so annoyed this is so if this was written in the 60s i'd get it vegetarian says tofa stopped in his tracks okay he looks at steaks again so medium well is that supposed to be a joke because i still have revolting meat fumes in my nose and those steaks were once an animal Boy, Ava, wait till you hear about what happens to all the baby meal chicks that can't produce your precious eggs for your vegetarian omelettes. Vegetarians are the worst. Sincerely me, king of the vegans. <laughs> I'm being facetious. I just don't like how puritanical she's being because it's like, come on. Harold ends up stealing one of the steaks. Matt's parents ring the doorbell. Chapter 10. Oh my god, oh my god, I'm beyond excited and nervous. In fact, I'm a bit hyper. Matt's parents are on their way up and I don't want to over-dramatise it, but meeting them is basically one of the biggest moments of my life. I hope they get a restraining order. Because let's suppose that Matt and I stay together forever. Just suppose we do. Then this is my new family. They'll be part of my life for good. We'll have nicknames and in-jokes and I'll probably do little errands for them and we'll laugh happily at the antics of the children Matt and I will have. Ava freaks out that she doesn't know if Matt wants children or not. So she asks him right there and then. Obviously, this is crucial stuff to know about someone. It is deal breaker stuff. But I cannot suspend my disbelief, Kinsella, that this bloke wouldn't run a mile from all of this. It is the time, I contradict him a little wildly. It's exactly the time because I might be about to meet the grandparents of my future babies. I gesticulate at the front door. Grandparents? That's a big deal, Matt. Matt looks utterly baffled. Doesn't he follow my logic? I've been perfectly clear. So I don't like the character of Matt because he's unbelievably dull and personality less, but I do feel sorry for him at times. Then again, he is choosing inexplicably to put up with this. Matt does want children someday. Boo, boring. Why does the world need more personality less people anyway? Cause I swear that shit's genetic. Okay, Matt is scanning my face warily. So is this conversation done? I smile happily up at him. Yes, I just think it's good to get things straight, don't you? Matt doesn't reply. I'll take that as a yes. Then the distant ping sounds and I stiffen. So he's already fed up with her. Also, she's not even met his family yet, but she's imagining children with him. Do people not understand that if you enter a serious relationship with someone, you are taking on their family too and all the baggage that comes with that? If they're a bunch of gits, you are stuck with them for the rest of your life if you have kids. Even if you end up like breaking up with that person. If kids are in the mix, their family are gonna be part of your life for the rest of your life. Add short-sighted people to my mega list of people who I think shouldn't be allowed to have kids in the first place. Ava meets the parents and looks like a nutter. Hello, I say in an emotional rush. I love your bag and your shoes. Wait, that came out wrong. You don't say both, you pick one. Elsa looks disconcerted and glances at her shoes. I mean, your bag, I hastily amend. That's a great bag, look at the clasp. Tragic. I'm waiting for Elsa to say, how did you two lovebirds meet? Or even, well, aren't you adorable? Which is how Russell's mother first greeted me. Russell's mum was a lot nicer than Russell, it turned out. But instead, Elsa eyes me in silence, then turns to Matt and says, Genevieve sends her love. I feel a tiny jolt of shock, which I conceal with a wide smile. Genevieve sends her love? See, if you get into a relationship where the mother of your partner wants to compare you to their ex all of the time and your partner does nothing to establish a boundary, leave. So it won't get better, especially if they're a mummy's boy. Or you will put up with this shit for the rest of your life and who has time for that, honestly? Matt turns the book over and a stunning woman of about 30 stares out of the back cover. She has long blonde hair, a delightful sparkle in her blue eyes and beautiful, elegant hands which she's resting her chin on. I gulp inwardly. That's Genevieve? Then I realise I've seen her before in a photo on the Harriet House's website, though I didn't clock her name. I remember thinking at the time, she's pretty. Another weird trope that I've noticed in these types of books and I dislike heavily, the boring male lead always has an ex-girlfriend who is so glamorous and so beautiful and keeps trying to butt back into his life. An ex-girlfriend that usually the lead refuses to put up a proper boundary against and who the family all prefer naturally. I swear, 
These rom-com books are meant to serve as fantasies. So what is this weird fetishization of feeling inferior to another woman? It propagates women versus women nonsense. There's a natural inclination to know more about the people your partner has dated before. And maybe jealousy rears its ugly head in a superficial, <laughs> can't believe my partner had sex before they ever met me though, even though we're both in our like twenties. But I don't think obsessing over your partner's ex is a thing that healthy and well-adjusted people in their late twenties do. Early and mid go nuts, but once you start to like, once all this is developed and you grow up a bit, mm. in fact, this is something that had I been a teenager would have bothered me. But now that I'm like a proper adult, 21, now that I'm a proper adult adult, yeah, you know, meeting exes and stuff, it's happened. And when it did, I realized, wow, I've really matured because I'm not bothered, I don't care, who cares? That not bothered me, didn't bother me. Would have if I was 16. So where this kind of nonsense in these books come from, I don't know, I'm sure I can blame internalized misogyny on it somehow. However, I did realize if my current relationship fails, whisper so he doesn't hear, I will be this person for that next woman. <laughs> I am successful, I am funny, I am glamorous, I have a forehead stiffer than a corpse. Take that imaginary future woman. Matt's father kicks Ava back into the living room so he can talk to Matt privately, but they come in a few minutes later. There's plenty of time, says Elsa. She deposits her bag on a nearby low store and starts flipping through the book. There was a particular photograph I wanted to show you. She adds to Matt, my hair is going static. It's a lovely one of Genevieve as a child. Have the mothers of sons ever considered being fucking normal? Harold, sensing the mum being a freak, attempts to attack her handbag and in the scuffle, Ava murders Genevieve and her cold lifeless remains are scattered around the apartment for everyone to see. Somehow as I lunged, I caught the book and now I've ripped loose the cover, right down the middle of Genevieve's face. Genevieve, cries Elsa hysterically as those that I've attacked her in person and whips the book away. What have you done? At least... That's what it seems like to this wombat. Elsa and John leave. Elsa to be a ice queen somewhere else and John, who knows, who cares. Chapter 11. Ava texts her friends some faux positivity, of course. It's amazing. He has a great flat. Really cool. My eyes drift towards the hairless wolf and I shudder. Must be exhausting living in denial. Ava quizzes Matt lightly about Genevieve. Oh, right. Well, okay. Yes, we were together. Matt pauses, as though thinking how best to describe his relationship with Genevieve. Finally, he draws breath and concludes, then we broke up. Imagine being this closed off. All this bloke has going for him is he's attractive. Yawn. Harold destroys one of Matt's shirts. Oh God, sorry. I should have told you. Harold has a real thing about men's shirts. They have to be kept out of his reach or he worries them to death. Men's shirts? Matt looks astounded. Yes, he's very intelligent, I add, unable to hide my pride. He can tell the difference between my clothes and a man's shirt. He thinks he's protecting me. Don't you, Harold? Dogs have up to 300 million olfactory, is it pronounced like that? Olfactory? Receptors in their nose. Of course he can tell the difference between something that's yours and something that's a bloke's or a stranger's. Even you could take a sniff of a shirt and tell the difference, you weirdo. Also, he's probably destroying stuff because he's bored of being in this awful book. Matt gazes silently at his mangled shirt, then at Harold's perky face, then finally at me. Ava, he says, do you know for a fact Harold experienced a trauma of a handbag when he was a puppy or have you invented it to account for his behavior? Instantly, I feel my hackles rise up on beh Harold's behalf. What is this? The Spanish Inquisition? Just break up weirdos. He reaches down to ruffle Harold's head and my heart melts all over again. Just when I think things are getting the tiniest bit prickly between Matt and me, something happens to make me remember why we're meant to be. That is quite the assumption. They have sex. Ava hates Matt's bed. Ava hates everything about Matt's life except for the sex. She hates his room temperature, for example. She tries to sleep but can't because of his lumpy hard bed. So she gives up and goes to have a cup of tea but can't find any biscuits because they aren't even compatible when it comes to snacking. She finds a tub containing biscuits. As I gape down, I can't believe it. This tub is full of phone chargers all twisted around each other. There's no chocolate, no chocolate. To be fair, one of the most barbaric twists in life is finding that tin in the kitchen that proclaims to have shortbread inside, you know, the one shaped like this. Ooh, we've all got it, we've all got it. But upon opening it, only finding various sewing kits and thread. Every kitchen in England has the exact same predicament because life is a cruel mistress. And now rage is starting to brew in me. What kind of twisted warped person puts phone chargers in a tub labeled chocolate rolls? It's playing mind games is what it is. It's gaslighting. For once, Ava, I'm inclined to agree. Matt has been awoken by Ava's wailing, so he goes to run her a warm bath. Of course, this goes wrong too. 
Thank you so much, I say gratefully to Matt as I step in the scented water and sit down. Then I gasp forcefully as the lukewarm water meets my skin. What the hell is this? Sorry, I exclaim in dismay. This is, it's not, I'm already standing up, water streaming off of me. It's tepid, I'll freeze in here. Sorry, tepid, Matt gapes at me. It's warm, he dips his arm in the water. Warm, is he telling me I'm wrong about my own body temperature? It's not warm enough for me, I can hear the tension in my voice again. I like it really warm, but... Matt's arm is still in the water and he's gazing at me in disbelief. You know when people, usually on podcasts, waffle on about the differences between the sexes to back up their own prejudices or agenda or whatever? This is a very real one, and yet it's never mentioned. Boys are happy to bathe in cold baths, whereas women tend to prefer it hot. I'm on Ava's side again. As I swoosh my hand back and forth, I'm letting a few unwelcome thoughts stray into my head. I know Matt's the perfect man for me. I know he is. But there are just a few aspects of his life which are, well, not negative, definitely not, but challenging. The weird art, the golf, the meat, the parents, the room temperature. Gonna spoil the story and tell you they stay together at the end despite having nothing in common. I don't understand what message the book is portraying. Had it been about the folly of insta love, I would have accepted it, but no. Things are... We've had a couple of hiccups, but we can do this. We can make it work. After all, we built a pebble tower together. Remember? We leapt off rocks together. We both like ice cream. We're a great team. I shoot him a hopeful, encouraging smile and his face flickers as though with fond memories. I want to make it work, he says firmly. Believe me, Ava. I do. Why do they want it to work so badly? Ava is optimistic to the point of ongoing delusion, so let's ignore her, as we should. But why does Matt want to make it work. They've only known each other for a little over a week. There is no reason for them to keep trying. They aren't in a long-term relationship. They don't already have kids. They're not married. Why bother forcing yourself to be with someone you're just incompatible with? We're like two different countries, I explain. Call them Averland and Matland. We need to acclimatize to each other's cultures. So for example, in Matland, it's perfectly reasonable to keep phone charges in the tub labeled chocolate rolls. Whereas in Averland, that's a capital offense. We have to just learn about each other, I emphasize. Learn and become accustomed to each other. You see? Hmm, Matt is silent for a few moments as they take in the sim. In Matland, he volunteers, dogs sleep on the floor. You don't upend your dog's routine just for some random bloke, nor any bloke get fucked. Also, it's no good learning without knowing how to compromise. Chapter 12. It's nearly three weeks later, and as I shower in Matt's bathroom, I'm pensive. Not in a bad way. God, no. Of course not. Just in a thoughtful way. I keep picturing Matt, and it's almost as if there are two men in my head. There's Dutch, the man I fell in love with in Italy. Dutch with his curto pajamas and smouldering eyes and general air of being some sort of hunky artisan... <laughs> artisan carpenter. Then there's Matt, who gets up every day and puts on a suit and sells Harriet House dolls and comes home and puts golf balls. You fell in love with an idealised version of this bloke and you don't like the real thing. That is why it's called a holiday fling. Just dump him. Ava doesn't like that Matt has to work a lot, Ava. She also doesn't like how much he plays golf. She also doesn't like that he's got no interest in vegetarianism. I feel like food compatibility is a big deal in relationships. After all, the standard is to eat three meals a day. How stressful would it be if you feel like you're butting heads over ethics and morality at every mealtime. Veggies don't need to date only veggies, but I could never date someone who wanted to be intolerant of my food choice. Like my boyfriend's not vegan, he eats a lot more plant-based since being with me, but he's not, he's not vegan. Once in the blue moon, I'll admit, I do get a little bit like, what about the animals? Poor, like if we go past the field, I'm like the poor cows. But he always goes out of his way to make sure there's options for me at gatherings or days out or holidays. He's also always up for trying new things if he hears about them, etc., etc. So I'm perfectly fine with this dynamic. This bloke doesn't even, rem he doesn't remind his like friends that she's vegetarian. He doesn't remind his parents that she's vegetarian either. So she often has to like just eat nothing at events, he, don't, he doesn't give a shit. Quite often when I ask, what did you have for lunch? Hoping he might say tofu and it was delicious. He answers a burger, as though it's obvious. Well, if someone's never made a habit of eating tofu, then they certainly won't without any pointers on how to make it nice. I am convinced that if you can't make tofu edible, you're just not a good cook. Tofu is a sponge that marinates and soak up the flavors of whatever you want to imbibe it with, is that the word? And tofu is a staple in a lot of East Asian dishes. For the taste and the texture, it's not strictly just the veggies option each time. In fact, traditional Mapo tofu contains meat. I think it contains pork. But tofu is also in there because the taste and texture is nice if you just know how to cook with it. I'll eat it raw, I don't care. Expecting a carnival westerner to magically know what to do with tofu or how to prep it is ludicrous. 
That's on you, Ava. That's on you. Also, and this is more recent, he's been a bit moody, but when I've asked him what's wrong, he won't answer. He goes silent. He almost turns into a rock. Ah uh, yes, wouldn't it be a leading man without being mysterious and completely devoid of a personality? By contrast, I am never a rock. My work is not intrusive, nor do I have weird art, nor a flat kept to an antisocial temperature. I know he keeps turning the thermostat down when he thinks I won't notice. It sounds like he's, he's a dad already. But if you're that much better than him, do him a favor and dump him. As I finish my shower and get dressed, something else is bugging me, which is Genevieve. I can't stop Googling her, which I know is a mistake, but she's so Googleable. She's always doing something adorable on Instagram or announcing some new piece of Harriet's house merchandise on her YouTube channel. Plus I've heard Matt mentioning her on the phone to his parents he was saying quite forcefully dad you need to listen to genevieve she gets it which kind of made me blink oh dear ava wants to talk about previous relationships with matt Uh uh-huh says matt looking less than enthusiastic so i have an idea i continue thought you might mutters matt so quietly that i can barely hear him what i narrow my eyes they've been with each other for a month and can barely conceal their detest usually the honeymoon periods like that's longer than a month this one lasted for a week. Ava asks how serious it was with Genevieve and doesn't get any real response. So Ava overshares about her ex Russell and Matt gets bored. What? I peer at him. What about your other three questions? Oh right, says Matt as though he'd forgotten. I'll get to those another time. He disappears into the bathroom and I gaze after him, flabbergasted and just a little offended. He had three more questions. How could he not be burning to know more? I still have a zillion questions about Genevieve. Maybe he doesn't care about your life. They are getting ready to go to a picnic with Ava's friends. Feeling disconcerted, I head out to the living space. There weren't supposed to be any glitches today. I'm taking Matt to meet my friends at Maud's birthday picnic, and it was all supposed to be wonderful and happy and perfect. I mean, it is wonderful and happy and perfect, I remind myself quickly. I just wish Genevieve hadn't gotten under my skin. Who are you trying to convince? This is exhausting. Ava tries to get Matt's flatmates to tell her about Genevieve because she doesn't understand boundaries and respect even if the person in question is a tit. Topher tells Ava that she shouldn't worry about Genevieve but instead should worry about Sarah, the girl after Genevieve. Sarah used to stalk Matt a bit because, of course, he's so dreamy despite having the personality of a public toilet that he makes girls go irrational. How Christian Grey of him. Look, in another context, we obviously, if someone's getting like a little bit stalked by someone, we shouldn't blame the person. But uh, again, it's just a trope. It's it's the Christian Grey trope of, oh, he's so dreamy. Of course, like girls are doing crazy things to be with him. This Genevieve person, spoiler alert, is basically still in love with him because of course she is. He's also got a stalker, blah, 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 you know what I mean? Liz, how many bloody girlfriends has Matt had? Well, considering he's in his late 30s, I'd assume more than one, you children of the corn. That's a great insult. Well done. Topher and Nihal warn Ava about how much Harriet House loves Genevieve. Ava gets ready to leave for the picnic, but Matt is enraptured by some percentages. There's silence as he and Matt stare at the screen while Nihal gazes at his phone, gripped. I'm not watching. I refuse to. This is the stupidest fixation I've ever known. All of them are obsessed by the number of internet users in the world. There's a live internet counter that you can watch. Every so often it reaches some key number and they all stand breathlessly watching the numerals turning over. I was there when the count reached 4.6 billion and had the whole thing explained to me. I stood there absolutely baffled while we watched the counter go from 4.6 to 4.6 billion. All three guys high-fived and how actually cheered. And now they're avidly watching again, the number of internet users in the world. I mean, why? It's so weird. It's so random. Weird and random is only acceptable when it's Ava making tie-dyed cushions to sell on Etsy. Chapter 13. Right, Matt seems somewhat alarmed by the prospect of Maud, so I hastily move on. Nell can be a bit... She's a character. She has views. And Sarika's quite the perfectionist. But I love them all. And you have to too, as well. The part of deal. Don't worry, that's pretty obvious, says Matt with a wry expression. I peer at him, puzzled. Mmm, nothing like forced friendship. Mac makes a remark that she's always WhatsApping them and Ava is about to blow up, but maybe not during sex, says Matt and I stare at him, brought up short. Sex? What's he talking about? I don't WhatsApp during sex. I don't, I retort. You do? I wouldn't ever WhatsApp during sex. I'm not that type of person. The last time we had sex, Matt says calmly, you broke off and sent a WhatsApp. Dumpable events. Bloke wants to do this to me didn't last they reach a compromise to not answer work calls at 11 p.m nor text during sex wow don't make too much progress all at once guys matt needs to take a work call before saying hi to ava's friends which is polite you realize you're an inspiration to us all she says addressing us both you meet on holiday you know absolutely nothing about each other you're practically strangers and here you are the perfect couple 
I know, I say, glancing fondly at Matt. Isn't it amazing? How and why is Matt going along with this? Sophie Kinsella was born in London. She's met London men before. What is this? What is this weird fantasy? Yes, it is a miracle, really, I say, dragging Matt closer to me and wrapping my arm around his waist. Sarika's into online dating, I add to Matt. She believes in the power of the algorithm, but I don't. I mean, be honest. Would you have gone for me if you'd seen my profile on a dating site? Even as I'm saying the words, I realise I don't actually want Matt to answer the question. Whatever, I hastily chime in as he draws breath. Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. It's irrelevant, because here we are. And what brought us together wasn't a computer. I allow myself a tiny disparaging smile. I'm not guided by a piece of code that some stranger wrote. I'm guided by my own internal natural code. My instinct, I bang my heart. My instinct was that we would be compatible. And I was right. I've annoyed myself. I annoyed myself reading that. All this talk about computers and codes. I have, I've been recently playing and completed and got the bad ending for one of the characters. Detroit become human. Jump. The plight, the future plight of Android and Android rights is such a touching. It's so close to my own heart. I'm going to be there in like 30 years time campaigning for Androids to have equal rights to humans because you just, I shouldn't get into it in this video, but I have a lot of thoughts, right? It's cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. If we create AI that can think of its own accord, that is sentient. Therefore, they are, they exist as their own right. We cannot create androids just to enslave them because you know that people are just going to create androids, sentient beings capable of feeling and thinking, etc. People are going to do it just to fuck them. I guess so. I actually genuinely get enraged thinking of this hypothetical, most likely going to happen future because people said, we can't even look after the planet or animals. We have no rights creating AI. No, no, not happening. It is going to happen, but I'm going to be against it. And don't even talk to me if you think, well, they're just machines. They're just emulating emotion. They're not actually feeling it. But do we actually feel emotion? Do we actually? Do we really feel things? Or is just everything electronic signals being interpreted by our brains to keep us alive? Is there validity in that? And if so, if you've designed a robot to have the same brain as a human how is it any less valid then oh i get so mad about this anyway 100 percent says matt at once and i feel a surge of love for him we have so much in common ava and i we both love he pauses as they surge him for words we both really enjoy he stops again apparently stumped i feel a slight tweak of annoyance because can't he think of one thing we both like there's so many there's sex and there's says oh that's so lovely how did you hurt your head by the way she adds looking at the plaster on matt's forehead Oh, Matt smiles ruefully and raises a hand to touch it. Pile of stuff fell on me at Ava's flat. It's pretty crowded in there and there's shit all over the place. Then Matt starts being passive aggressive about Ava's life to her friends. Do you have a dog? Asks Sarika. No, but my family keeps dogs. He pauses again. Although, you know, we train them pretty thoroughly. So a bit different. I can see both Nell and Sarika's eyes widening. Harold's trained, I say defensively. He sits, he stays sometimes. Harold's trained... Matt echoes with a laugh. Are you kidding? I mean, properly trained. If you saw my family's dogs, you'd understand. What are they trained to do? Demands Nell suspiciously, and I want to hug her for leaping to my side. Jump through hoops? Be civilized companions for their owners, says Matt easily, and I feel a tiny stab of annoyance because he knows I don't like the word owner. I don't like the term owner either. It's a bit archaic with negative connotations. That aside, he's meant to be making a good impression, but instead he is slagging her off to her own friends. And I'm a meat-eating capitalist, says Matt robustly. Sorry about that, he adds, sounding not at all but apologetic. But you're on the way to becoming vegetarian, I say, still trying to sound lighthearted. You're considering it, at least. Nope. <laughs> Matt shakes his head, and I feel a sunny, and I feel a surge of indignation, which I try to quell. How can he be so close-minded? Didn't he hear anything I told him about the planet? He's not even trying to act like they like each other. God, he's not even trying to placate her in the slightest. No big deal. No appears at me, staggered. Whilst she's always trying to placate him, meat is no big deal to you. No, I say defensively. It's not. We're in love. I clutch Matt again. The details are just details. Romantic love isn't some magical, mystical, unexplainable phenomena. It's biochemistry, trust, communication, compatibility, and attraction. The details do matter. You don't have to see eye to eye on everything. Let's not be absolutionists. But you do have to see eye to eye on some things. The big things you should see eye to eye on. 
whether to have kids, whether to get married, what to do with your finances. You need to see eye to eye on this. And I don't, I think, I don't think people should compromise on when it comes to like having kids. I think out of all of them, having kids is the most serious because you're creating life. And I do not think that should be something that people should compromise on. If one person doesn't, one person does, they shouldn't meet in the middle and just have one. You know, because that is a pretty risky gamble if the person who doesn't want kids agrees to that. Pretty risky and you're juggling someone's life. Not acceptable. So I think that shouldn't be compromisable. Little things like whose turn it is to do the dishes or take out the bin or, oh, if I do this one chore, can you do that? Oh, um, can you meet me here? Can you pick, like, can you pick me up from the state? Whatever. Those things, all compromisable. See eye to eye. Like you don't need to see eye to eye on what shows you enjoy. You can enjoy shows separately, but the big things, yes. And these two don't, apart from they both want kids, but I don't think either of them should. They get onto the subject of Matt's art, which Ava failed to mention to the girls because she hates it. When informed, they Google the artist and all try to not act shocked. Nell is meant to be this hard nut. So I'd have assumed that she would have minded weird art, but she kind of does, it's a bit, okay. They have Matt leave to get crisps and the girls tell Ava she needs to be honest with Matt about how she actually hates everything about him except the sex. Well, sod his parents, says Nell robustly. Ignore them, refuse to engage if they can't be more polite. But already Sarika's shaking her head. Bad strategy, Ava. You don't want them complaining about you to Matt putting a wedge between you. I'd say go the other way. Win his parents over. Go on a charm offensive. If they were better friends, they'd say the truest option is to dump him. Anyway, I think Matt's lovely, says Sarika supportively. What does he think of us? Oh, he loves you, I say automatically. He doesn't even know them. She is so fake. Maud arrives to be weird, already convincing Matt to do things for her. I'm not going to just say a flat no when someone asks me a favour, says Matt frowning. I'm a decent human being. That's how she gets to you, I retort. She makes you feel like a decent human being. She flutters her eyelashes gratefully and then boom, you've been got. I love Maud, but it's true. So she's just a user. Chapter 14. Maud's children are trying to beat up Matt because not training your dog nor your kids is quirky in this book. It's Maud's birthday and she gets really sad and drunk about being older. You're frightening our children, persists the woman, gesturing at a pair of toddlers who look about two years old and who are watching Maud avidly. And is alcohol allowed in the park? Frightening your children, counters Nell in outrage. How is it frightening to hear a strong, wonderful woman saying she is, exists? I'll tell you what's frightening. Our unequal society, that's frightening. Our politicians, they're frightening. If your children want to be afraid of something, be afraid of them. She glares at the two-year-old girl who gazes at Nell's furious face for a moment and then bursts into tears. Yeah, making children cry is very progressive of you. Must be that sick wave feminism I've been hearing about. Matt willingly takes Harold on a walk to get away from Ava's mad friends. Matt and Harold come back, both of them covered in mud because Harold started a fight with a Great Dane. Sophie Kinsella, how have you managed to make a dog annoying? Must be a skill. Matt's family are having a business meeting on the weekend, so Ava's friends prompt her to go instead of prompting her to run a mile in the opposite direction. Matt reluctantly agrees to it. His funeral, chapter 15. They're on the way to his parents. Ava hasn't been sleeping properly because of Matt's hard bed. It's been six weeks. Sleep deprivation is real and you can't make up any sleep debt that you lose. He is literally negatively affecting her health. Dump him. I'll admit I was a bit surprised that first time I woke up and Harold was on the other side of the bed snuggling up to Matt instead of me. But I absolutely don't feel rejected or anything. My darling Harold can sleep where he likes. Dogs sit on people's feet when they feel affection or close to them, as Harold is doing to Matt. Harold probably respects Matt more. I don't like Matt's general attitude towards Harold, but he's right in that Harold does need proper training to feel more secure and part of the pack hierarchy, and also to feel more bonded to humans, because it's a bonding thing, in it. And his obsession with security is driving me nuts. He still keeps going on about my lovely picturesque back door onto the fire escape, just because the wooden frame has gone a bit soft. He says it's an invitation for thieves. Last time he came around, he actually started quoting crime statistics for the area. He wants me to either replace the door or buy six billion chains and padlocks, which would totally ruin the look. He's right. Matt is right about a few things. His biggest issue is that he's completely soulless. Ava is also soulless, but overcompensates by being incredibly annoying and fake. Ava doesn't even like food shopping with Matt. I mean, he buys crap. He just does. Terrible processed breakfast cereal, non-organic apples, juice boxes. I had to take everything out and replace it. And I was thinking to myself, it's so tragic that he won't care about what he puts into his body. When suddenly he woke up in the wine section, I'd put my usual bottle of white in the trolley. The one with the lady on the front. The irony. Oh, he doesn't care about his body, buys wine. 
No amount of God, why did I get my high horse about some things? No amount of alcohol has positive be benefits on your bodily health. The antioxidant stuff is nonsense. Just eat some blueberries. There are slight perceived social benefits as alcohol lowers inhibitions and abuse with your vocal confidence, but it's fake, not real. People paradoxically have a glass of wine, a stress relief, even the alcohol dresses out your body to process it. It is inflammatory and you start to rely on having a glass feel relief, which is a bad cycle. Get bent Ava. <sighs> PSA over. Then we passed the meat counter and I'll draw a mental veil over what happened there. It was too distressing and that butcher did not have to fall about laughing. It wasn't funny. <sighs> Another high horse moment, please forgive me. Cows are forcibly impregnated all their lives to produce milk for you but are ultimately getting murdered. Shut up, vegetarian. <laughs> it's just she's being so shrill and wingpy. I can't help myself. They get to Matt's family home, which of course is some sort of stately mansion. Of course it is. Matt doesn't respond. He doesn't seem wild about the china. In fact, he doesn't seem wild about anything. Ever since we arrived, his shoulders have been slumped and his face seems frozen. You must be really proud, I say, trying to infuse him. Why is she trying to force him to feel things that he doesn't? There are trophies and photos of Matt's brother, the famous golfer, but not Matt. Elsa arrives to not so subtly hate on Ava and also dunk on Matt for never being a professional sportsman. Matthias, I've just been speaking to Genevieve, she continues, and she will be Skyping in for the meeting this afternoon. Very generous of her to give up her weekend, don't you think? Elsa's splintery eyes suddenly swivel to me as though expecting a response. Yes, I say with a nervous jump. Really generous. Simp. Matt shoots me a slightly astonished look and I try to smile back, but I suddenly feel like an idiot. Why did I say that? Why am I bigging up Matt's ex-girlfriend who I've never even met? It's Elsa. She's put an evil spell on me. Then I catch my own thoughts in horror. No, stop it. Elsa's my future mother-in-law. Presumptuous. And we're going to love each other. We just have to find common ground. There must be loads of stuff we have in common. You can't force someone's love and there is an element of sadomasochism in trying so hard to appease an unrelenting twat like Elsa. Ava has zero self-respect. Chapter 16. It's an hour later and my cheekbones are aching from my fake smile. No difference from normal then surely. The food's good at least which is today the vegetables are. Everyone else is eating chicken but Elsa forgot I was vegetarian so I'm just munching my way through a mound of carrots. Yeah forgotten purpose you loser. Ronald, Matt's granddad, is the only person talking to Ava but is to bemoan about a scam that happened to him and none of the family care to listen to him so they always cut him off in conversation. Elsa wants Ava to compete at a yoga championship. The family head off for a meeting and Elsa tells Ava to go use the indoor swimming pool. Elsa's Austrian cousins are at the pool. They are nice to Ava but swim like Olympians so Ava instead goes to the steam room and sauna. Tories. She heads to the sauna to be with the cousins and they are all naked. What do I do now? What? Am I supposed to get naked too? Shut the door, says Greta, gesturing at me. And before I can get my thoughts straight, I'm closing it. Sit down, adds Heike. Heike? Shifting up on the bench, her veiny breasts swaying as she does so. No, do not look at her breasts or her... Oh God, stop. Don't look. I hastily swing my eyes from Heike and find myself peering at Inga's pink nipples. No, nope, pale nipples, which are eye level. In horror, I whip my head away to find myself regarding a mound of bushy pubic hair. She's very dramatic. My dude, have you never been to the changing room at the gym before? Ava probably never goes to the gym though. Who am I kidding? It's not quirky enough for her. All she probably does is puppy yoga. Three men come in and get naked as well. Look. They're European. They aren't filled with as much self-loathing as us Brits. It's a cultural difference. Ava leaves before Elsa and John arrive. She bumps into Matt and has a go at her for not warning her. No, he seems astonished. Ava, I didn't know anyone else would be there. It didn't occur to me that you'd take a sauna. Basically, I forgot. I'm so used to it. I forget. And really, he adds, lowering his voice as his parents approach down the path. Is it such a big deal? But as she starts telling me about the garden, my head is churning. Indignation is sparking around my body. Is it such a big deal? Is he for real? It's not that much of a, it's probably unexpected. It's not that much of a big deal though, is it? Chapter 17. By the time we get into the car an hour later, I'm bursting. I'm actually bursting. Arguments have been mounting up in my mind like planes waiting to land. First, Matt doesn't warn me about the naked sauna. Then he makes out I'm overreacting. Then over tea, he tells his parents that Harold needs training, even though he knows I don't like him saying that. <sighs> Dump him. Then, as I'm still reeling from that, his parents launch into a half-hour lecture on the eighth wonder of the world that is Genevieve. I know that Genevieve has appeared on the cover of three magazines, and she's going to film a TV documentary, and she has to have two assistants to deal with all the fan mail she receives. <sighs> Dump the parents too. But it was okay otherwise, says Matt after a few moments. I know he wants me to say it was lovely, and I know I should, but I can't. I'm feeling tetchy and stroppy. 
You shouldn't say things are wonderful if they aren't because nothing will change then. It's better to have five minutes of discomfort by being truthful and saying how you feel, even if the truth feels mean, than having months of discomfort because nothing changes because you kept quiet. That is proper good advice. No one ever listens to it though. One of my friends thinks I'm proper confrontational when things annoy me. And I suppose maybe as the average passive aggressive Brit, I am, but I would rather be co- not aggressive, just confrontational, be like, hey, I don't like this, or like this thing happens, annoyed me, this is annoying. I'd rather do that than swallow it and be passive aggressive and build up resentment for weeks and weeks and weeks. That building up resentment hurts more then just spending five minutes being like, I didn't like this thing, let's talk about it. Matt's parents also refused to eat the cake that Ava bought from a nice patisserie because they are petty. And then they just served biscuits at tea and I kept thinking, but what about the cake? Why don't we have the cake? Matt shoots me a wary look. They're probably saving it up. I think you're overreacting. I love it when a man invalidates me by telling me that I overreact to things. Mmm, dreamy. They start arguing about whose flat is better. There are bloody rescue plants everywhere. Your rescue bed is impossible to sleep in. At least my flat has character, I snap. At least it's not some monolithic concrete box. Character? Matt gives a short, incredulous laugh. It's crummy. That's that's rude. That's its character. Rescue books? Rescue books are not a thing, Ava. You're not making a noble gesture by housing crap. Crap? I stare at him, incensed. They hate each other and you cannot change my mind. That's why I hate the ending of this book so much. I would just like to go about my life without being injured, says Matt with sudden heat. That's all I ask. Every time I set foot in your flat, I get some injury or a bloody rescue yucca falls on me or my shirt gets shredded by Harold. I have had to buy six new shirts since we started dating. Did you know that? That's on average one a week. Six? I momentarily halted. I didn't realise that. I would have said maybe three. I love you. Matt sounds suddenly wary. But sometimes I feel like your life hates me. You can't love someone if you hate everything about them. Am I in La La Land? I'm in, I'm so, I'm like proper in two minds about this video because on one hand, I feel like I'm being very valid with my distaste for this entire thing. But on the other, maybe it's not that deep. It's just, it, it just really annoyed me and I'm petty enough that like, what, 10 months later I revisit it. I feel attacked. Your friends, geez. You know, every day Nell sends me some piece trashing Harriet's house. Why Harriet's house is misogynist. Why all feminists must boycott Harriet's house. It's a doll's company for God's sake. We may not be perfect, but we're not evil. Grow up, establish a boundary, tell her to do one. Simple. I'm sorry, Matt, I say, looking out the window, but I find your art disturbing and, and weird. Weird, Matt echoes, his voice hurt and scathing. One of the greatest, most acclaimed artists of our time. Weird. He may be great, but his art is still weird. So open-minded. Genevieve didn't think so, Matt says in cutting tones, like gasp inwardly. Oh my God, we're doing that, are we? What mature adult? in their late thirties does that, compares girlfriends. I didn't realize we were 16 again. Dumpable events because it's so childish. Well, Russell loved my rescue bed, I say equally curtly, and he loved my rickety windows and he thought Harold was lovely as he is. So, equally childish, grow up. These guys are meant to be in their thirties. I can't press that enough. She was playing you, Matt. I give a derisive laugh. I've seen Genevieve's Instagram page. I've seen her style and take it from me. She does not genuinely like your art. and No one likes it. My friends. Oh, we're back to your friends, says Matt in a hurt, angry roar. Of course we are. The Greek chorus. Do you ever leave off consulting them for five minutes of your bloody life? I included this because I liked the Greek chorus. I thought that was funny. Because you should. Because you said you would. Because the scientific evidence shows. Ava, I'm telling you now, says Matt flatly. I will never be a vegetarian. Limit me? Yes. Buy responsibly? Yes. Give up completely? Never. Never, he repeats as I gasp. I like meat. I feel as though he slapped me. For a few moments, I can't even draw breath pipe down Ava go eat some cheese for a few moments we're both silent as the rain starts to thunder down the car roof hers is crackling around the car like a lightning storm I can't bear it how are we like this why are we like this we were so happy standing on the Puglian hillside if I close my eyes I'm back there with olive trees all round the garland round my head suffused with love and optimism how has this fool never heard of a holiday romance before in the middle of the argument Ava gets a text from Sarika about Nell being ill from her lupus My voice has softened. As I glance over at him, all I feel is affection. All our jumpy, irritable problems seem to have melted away. Everything felt so hugely important while we were yelling at each other two minutes ago. But now I can't even remember why I got so stressed out. In fact, I feel ashamed. Matt and I aren't in pain. We're not ill. We're not struggling. We're the lucky ones. We can work it out. I hate this reasoning. It's important to have perspective and know that your problems aren't the be-all-end-all. They're not the biggest in the world. Whatever. 
But just because someone has an incurable illness does not mean you should suffer a shit relationship. That is some weird martyrdom right there. And illness isn't a choice. But staying in this mess is, Matt gifts Ava the pebble tower that they made in Italy. Thanks for a bunch of rocks. Thanks for nothing, Matt. I'm being facetious, of course. It's quite a nice gift. It's surreal. A moment ago, we were yelling at each other and now I'm almost in tears because no one has ever done something as lovely as this for me. I'm sorry too, says Matt gruffly. And I also wanted to thank you for something. The other night when you were making me smell all those aromatherapy oils, I'll confess, I was sceptical. I thought it was bullshit. But that oil you made for the office... You like it? I look up eagerly. I put it on my temples at work, like you said, and I rub it in. And it's good. It makes a difference, he shrugs. It makes me feel more chilled. I'm so pleased. She is one baby away from being a mum's now with her essential oils. Also, the problems they were arguing about magically solved now. It just took some oil and rocks. They agreed to go on a proper date. They've done this all backwards and it's just not working, is it? Ava goes to Nails to look after her. Chapter 18. For date night, they go to a vegetarian restaurant in Covent Garden. There's a good, I'll give a recommendation. There's a good one I know. It's called Sagar. Sagar. It's Indian. It's delicious. I take meat eaters like my mum and sister there. They don't even miss, they said they don't even miss the meat because it just, it's great. It's good. It's tasty. Anyway, enough about me. Sometimes in these videos, I get bored thinking about other characters. So I get the urge to start talking about me instead. How much attention can one person possibly need? Keep watching and find out. Excellent. Menu looks good, he adds with determined enthusiasm. And I feel another wave of love. He's not complaining about Harold ruining his shirt and he's being positive about vegetarian food. He's making a real effort here. <sighs> it's not fucking hard to eat vegetarian food. You still get to eat cheese and eggs chill out okay so here's the thing it's been six weeks give or take what has matt looks blank and i feel a tiny spurt of impatience which i try to suppress but honestly what does he think i'm talking about us i say patiently us right matt thinks about this for a moment then ventures i would have said longer yeah time sure does drag on when you're miserable ava has a book about how to acclimatize to a new country like a literal new country for expats and travelers and she's been conflating the advice inside this with her metaphorical Ava and Matt Land relationship nonsense. As I flick further on, I come to chapter seven when the charm wears off. But hastily, I turn the page because that's not relevant to us. Is there a chapter about living in denial? Get it? Well, what the book says is don't expect instant results. It takes six months to acclimatize minimum. Cheers. I lift my drink to his. Cheers. Six months, he adds after sipping. I mean, if you're not happy in the first month of a new relationship, it's probably better to call it quits. Matt's dad rings the restaurant landline to hassle Matt. Ava decides that she wants to visit Matt's office to understand how he works. Why don't you go do some actual work? Because I'm not convinced she does. We never hear about it. Matt invites her to the Harriet House Expo. Ava, Matt takes a long sip of beer looking beleaguered, which is his dad's fault, not mine. I don't know. This all seems like overthinking to me. Couldn't we just, you know, go with the flow? She's trying to force the relationship because it's not right. They leave the restaurant and there's a busking act wanting audience participation. So Matt volunteers. Who's he think he is? The busker is going to juggle flaming torches over Matt's body in Covent Garden. I have never seen this. Is this actually allowed? Surely this would, like, as a street performer, this would not be allowed in nanny state Britain where you need a license to carry a butter knife and kitchen scissors. Elf and safety gone bloody ballistic. He seems somehow transformed just by that one experience. There's a light in his eye and a lift in his voice. He sounds teasing, not rock-like. I've got my playful, carefree Dutch back, I suddenly realised, and I hadn't appreciated how much I'd missed him. She's gone six weeks without him being carefree and fun and they've been with each other for about like seven if you include Italy. It's mental. I, I don't understand. Can I be honest, Matt? I press on. I think you should try to switch off more. Shed your worries. I guess work gets everyone down, says Matt after a pause. Sorry if I'm antisocial sometimes. There's a tiny knot of frustration inside me. I want to retort. It's not just that you're antisocial. It's more than that. But at the same time, I don't want to ruin the mood. Even when she's happy having a nice moment with him she still wants to argue sounds healthy speaking of money says matt presently something i've been meaning to ask you ava did you ever get the money for that piece of freelance work it takes me a moment to work out what he's talking about but then i recall a few months ago i wrote a leaflet for a nearby independent pharmacy then weeks later i realized i hadn't invoiced them matt was with me when i sent the invoice out and i guess he's remembered all this time no i say vaguely but it's fine hasn't been that long well over a month he contradicts me and it was long overdue anyway you should chase them she's hopeless how is she affording rent you were honest with me a moment ago ava now can i be honest with you he takes my hands in his as though to soften his words sometimes just sometimes you're over optimistic about people and situations i gape at him over optimistic how is that even a thing optimistic is good i retort everyone knows that she's not overly optimistic about things she's 
faux optimistic. If anything, she lies to herself. She's fake. I'll chase the invoice, I say after a while. Without speaking, Matt tightens his hand around mine and I feel a swell of something warm inside me. <laughs> Not the white hot rush of first infatuation, but maybe second love. Solid love. The love that comes of knowing what's inside a person as well as they've been hanging out for like six weeks. You don't like no, no, no him. I love this man because of who he is and in spite of who he is all at once. And I hope he loves me the same way. Chapter 19. Ava tried out golfing by going to a driving range. She's complaining about it. Yet driving ranges... I don't like golf, but driving ranges are fun. Things did not fall into place. I aimed carefully at every single one of those wretched bloody balls and I missed them all. You get a bucket of like a hundred. I don't believe it. All. Do I need my eyes tested or my arms tested? Load of crap. How is someone this klutzy? It's meant to be endearing, but it isn't. She just comes across as hopeless. So golf was a bit of a fail. And then that night we had a row because Matt decided to tidy up my flat and got rid of some essential notes for my book. Like essential. They were ratty post-its, he said when I confronted him. You hadn't looked at them for weeks. But I was going to, I said furiously. They were vital to my novel. I'm on her side. You shouldn't chuck out people's things. It's entitled behaviour. See this constantly on Am I the Arsehole? Ava wants to start a podcast. Good luck with that. They are hosting a party tonight with their respective friend groups. Matt's parents want Matt to spend a year in Japan helping us construct a Harriet House theme park. He doesn't want to. I'll do. Sounds great. No, wait. I put a hand on his arm. I'm being serious. I feel like you're two different people. Sometimes you're alive and fun and smiling, like last week in Covent Garden. That was wonderful. But other times, in fact, most of the time, to be honest, I bite my lip. You seem like someone else. Ava, what are you talking about? Replies Matt irritably. I'm the same guy. You're not. The guy I met in Italy was easygoing, relaxed, but now you're back. You're a miserable git, supplies Matt. He's been happy once in six weeks. Is Ava a masochist? Is this codependency? I want you to live your best life, I say in loving tones. But if I hoped that would touch him, I was wrong. He flinches. Live my best life, he echoes scathingly. How incredibly exhausting. The thing is, Ava, I'm content with my mediocre and disappointing life. So sorry about that. She is quite patronising. Right, I nod. That's great. But none of that is about you, is it? None of that is about your happiness, your fulfilment. Fuck's sake, Matt sounds at the end of his tether. This is work. It's business. It's your life. Yes, Ava. My life. She's annoying. Sometimes work is just work. Look at this job. Right. Some people would say this is a dream job. And it's great. I've worked like, I'm not like, you know, Alfie Days and those other YouTubers who didn't have proper, you know, they worked like one Saturday a month somewhere and they made it big onto YouTube. I've grafted. I've done like hospitality, office work, all of it. Sales. Ugh. This is easier than hospitality. No question. But is some of it work? Yeah, the fun part is being on camera. I like doing this part, yeah. Scripting can be fun, though it is a bit tedious, a bit arduous. Editing, that's the work part. Don't like it, so I try and outsource. I have no passion for editing, but I do it to get the job. No. Admin, the SEO part, filling out all the other stuff. Having to liaise and negotiate with sponsors. Ugh. How to best work out how to make the video as attention grabby and clickbaity as humanly possible. Those parts are the work part. Not everything is roses all the time, but you do that because sometimes work is just work, isn't it? You just get on with it. Ava complains to Topher about Matt and his job, and Topher agrees with her. Yeah, whatever. Topher comes up to a sitting position on his mat and regards me quizzically. You have to understand, it's not a job for Matt, it's an answer. An answer to what? I say, confused. This day was annoying me. To the nightmare of being Rob Warwick's brother. Topher swings over and starts doing press ups. Matt has had to be the older brother of the champion golfer his whole life. He's always felt inadequate. I don't care about Matt's insecurities. Can I understand? Of course I can. I'm well smart in it. Do I care? No. Because he's miserable. He's boring. He's literal. How am I meant to care about his problems where I do not care about his character? Ava's friends arrive. Sarika has invited a bloke along for a date who is her perfect match according to dating algorithms. Maud meets Nahal and asks him within five sentences to help fix her laptop. I think this is meant to be an endearing trait. It's not. She bestows her most dazzling smile on him and Nahal blinks at her a few times. Maud, he says mildly, you're a friend of Ava's and you seem like a very nice person. So obviously I would like to help you. But I think that was an inappropriate request, bearing in mind that we only met a few minutes ago. So I'm afraid I'll be turning you down on this occasion. With apologies, he gives her a sweet, implacable smile. So that's her right. I've got used to Topher's hulking, powerful, ugly frame. But as I see him afresh from the viewpoint of my friends, I realise again how <laughs> unconventional he looks with his fleshy, cratered face and huge eyebrow. What a bitch. Leave him alone. Nell and Topher get on like a house they've set on fire. You know me, smug with my words. Maybe I should write a book. You hate people. 
I do hate a number of people as it happens. No nods. People are shit. Yes, agreed. Topher lifts his glass to her. Also, I have lupus, she adds in an offhand manner. Oh, as Topher digests this, his face is impassive, but I can see his deep set eyes scanning Nell's face intently. Bummer. Nahal, why the fuck haven't you cured lupus yet? Topher whips around to address Nahal in suddenly accusing tones. I'm not in medical research, among other reasons, Nahal says patiently. That's no excuse. Topher swings back to Nell. I'm so sorry. It's all my flatmate's fault. He's a lazy bastard. He pauses, then adds, so here's a pertinent question. Are you allowed to drown your solos in tequila? I think the best part of this book is Nell and Topher getting on. Kinsella is a competent writer. Don't think that I don't know that nor appreciate that. But the main point, the main plot of this story misses the mark completely. If I'm being really reasonable and fair, which I don't extend this courtesy to the awful trio, the cast duo E.L. James and Stephanie Mayer. I don't extend this to them, right? So I'm this is my olive branch. I suppose th it's bound to happen. You're bound to throw a dud if you've written a lot of books, which she has. Like Stephen King, sometimes his endings are fine, sometimes they land, sometimes they're bad or random or whatever. I still like him, even though he's obsessed with tits. I'm sure I still like you, Kinsella. I'm sure if I read other ones, right, finish the shopaholic thingy, I'm sure I'd quite enjoy it. This book is just a bit of a miss though. Chapter 20. Everyone gets drunk. Harold destroys Matt's scarf so he p gets put on the bastard. I didn't explain what... That so at uh, Matt's, they have this chart and they call it the bastard chart. So whenever the flatmates have been bastards, they get a tick next to their name and then they have to probably buy each other a pint. I don't know. Sam arrives. Sarika's date. This sounds like a terrible first date idea, by the way, turning up to a flat of your dates with all of her friends really drunk. I'm Maud, says Maud, tossing back her hair and giving him a dazzling smile. You're an accountant, right, Sam? That's such a coincidence because I don't actually remember if Maud has a husband or a divorce, but let's say she does. Like, I'm pretty sure she does, but I can't remember. I don't think it's a coincidence that we don't meet Maud's husband. He's probably staying away so he doesn't get badgered so much by her. Your Marmite lovers? Topher surveys him and Sarika with disfavour. Well, no wonder the pair of you found each other. There are only two of you in existence. You revolt me. Marmite is an English delicacy and you know it. Loads of people love it. What are you talking about? I'll eat it with a spoon, a teaspoon. Granted, high in sodium, but still. Sam turns out to be perfect. I misremembered this because I thought he ran away. Maybe I'm just thinking of what I'd do in his shoes. Maud's quizzing Matt about Harriet's house because this is so Maud. She only just clocked what Harriet's house actually is by idly picking up Genevieve's book five minutes ago. Oh, those houses, she exclaimed in astonishment. Those dolls, I know those, they're really famous. Maudie, what did you think we were talking about this whole time? Said Nell in fold exasperation, fond exasperation. And Maud replied vaguely, oh, I had no idea. I never know the names of things. Part of me wanted to run my eyes in this, but then part of me recognises that this is totally something that I would say and do. So Ava compares her and Matt's relationship to Sam and Sarika, who are getting on really well because they already knew so much about each other before the first date. We both turn to survey the happy couple again, and I notice that Sam has leaned even closer to Sarika. I bet he knows who Otolangi is, I find myself thinking, then hastily thrust the thought from my mind. It's irrelevant. Matt and I have a different kind of relationship. Not so matchy-matchy, more, well unmatchy matchy. Ava overhears Matt talking about how he was once engaged to Genevieve. She takes him to the bathroom, speaks to him privately. He was engaged for less than 24 hours with her. I think that this is something that would come up in conversation as a joke, you know, like something that you'd make fun of because less than 24 hours, come on. But it's definitely not something to get mad or jealous over. Like it didn't even last a day. It's funny if anything. No, Matt puts a fist to his head. I mean, yes, strictly speaking, she proposed to me and it was very hard to say no. So for a matter of hours, yes, we were engaged until I broke up with her, but that was it. I mean, it really was it. Relationship over. Right, I'm still breathing hard, poised to fight. I just started thinking of Detroit become human again. And I wanna, if you've played the game, don't you guys think that Connor looks more like Tom Holland than Tom Holland does? Something to leave you with. My name is Connor. I'm the android sent by Cyberlife. Where you can stick your instructions? <laughs> no. Where? Right, I'm still breathing hard, poised to fight, but I can't think of my next move because this doesn't actually sound quite as heinous as I what I was imagining. Genevieve at the altar and Matt backing away, still clutching his top hat. Yeah, it's really not a big deal. Ava brings up the video that she saw of Matt and Genevieve getting really along really well at a presentation. Ava has never heard of acting before. It can't just have been professional chemistry. I challenged him instead. You fancied her and she fancied you. Well, said Matt looking uncomfortable. 
Maybe, but we weren't even a couple yet in that video. We were just two colleagues agreeing with each other. Oh no, what a crime. He fancied someone else before he knew that Ava existed. Sam seems perfect, but drops a bombshell while Sarika is in a bathroom. He moved flat, so he's now half an hour away from a tube station. Sarika's... Did I ever mention this? Sarika's deal breaker. What's the time? Oh God, it's 2am. I can finish this and edit this. I can do that. Sarika's deal breaker is that a bloke can't live more than 10 minutes away from a tube station because she's fed up of having to trek to the middle of nowhere for a bloke. Fair enough. All the girls immediately hassle him to move, either move closer to a tube or use a skateboard on a new route so he's only eight minutes away technically. Harold has destroyed the teddy bear that Sam had bought for his neighbour who recently had a baby. Harold is annoying. That hurts me to say it, but he is. Genevieve rings. Time for some forced drama. Chapter 21. Seven more, seven more in the home run. Come on. Things are generally good. I keep reminding myself. The party was deemed a massive success. In fact, it went on to 2 a.m. <laughs> Lightweights. Ava and Matt go to the expo. Matt is basically famous in this place and the fangirls there were invested in his and Genevieve's relationship. So Ava decides to Google about their relationship gossip because that's always a great idea. Ava meets Genevieve. I wheel round to see a vision in pink with clouds of blonde, blow-dried hair, accompanied by two guys in jeans with headsets. I recognise her from the book, but she's even prettier in real life. She looks phenomenal. I have to give her that. All petite in her perfectly fitting pink trouser suit and sky-high fuchsia heels. Yeah, of course she does. Of course she's perfect. Of course she does. Time to feel bad about ourselves. Genevieve decides to gossip with Ava. Well, it has. I can say this to you. She leans forward as though imparting a delicious secret. My commission is through the roof. There are some very big celebrity collectors, and I mean huge. She hands me a cup of coffee. You'd be amazed if I could tell you. Obviously I can't, but let's just say household names. Let's just say private jets. Let's just say shut the fuck up. She shakes her hair back and checks her reflection in the back of the teaspoon. There's one celebrity I assist with her collecting. I mean, if you knew who it was, you'd die. Yeah, I wish I had whilst reading that. See, says Genevieve triumphantly. I can't tell you her name, but that's an A-lister. She shows her a text on her phone. Clearly she's waiting for a reaction. All the text says is thank you. See, I remember that because I literally finished writing this script three hours ago. She's clearly waiting for a reaction. What am I supposed to do? Fall on my knees and kiss the phone? Amazing, I say politely. Well done you for knowing celebrities. Sarcastic Ava is much better than normal Ava. Well, Genevieve gives a self-deprecating laugh. In a way, I am a celebrity. In an itty bitty way. Who talks like this? She laughs again and smooths down her hair. Clearly what she means is in a gigantic, colossal way. She's annoying, but it'd be more unusual if she wasn't annoying in this book. My jaw's gonna click and I hate it. Please, Ava, you don't need to feel threatened. You mustn't feel threatened. I said this to the last girl too. I said, look, I'm close to the family. I understand the family. I dated Matt for longer than any other girlfriend. But at the end of the day, what does that matter? Then I'm still in the frame? No, it's his life. He's out there having fun before he... She gives an easy shrug. You know. Her words are shimmering through my head and I'm trying to unpick them, but she's such a pink toxic presence, it's hard. No, I don't know, I say at last. Oh my God, Genevieve puts down her coffee, blinking innocently. I'm not saying he's going to end up with me. That's not what I'm saying. Who am I? I'm out of the picture. Biscuits? Sorry, but this is actually cartoon levels of ex-girlfriend villain Bray. I have never met anyone who acts like this. I don't mean like, you know, boyfriends or previous boyfriends, exes either. I just mean in general. I've never heard of another woman saying this directly to a woman's face. I can understand like people being snide to their friends. I've heard that. Who hasn't? But directly to a current girlfriend's face or directly to a woman's face? Get out. I swear down, this shit only happens on Reddit or in America. Ava stomps away back to Matt. Wait, Ava. Matt appears at my side, dodging a pair of handsome young men wearing heavy makeup, Harriet wigs and sequined evening dresses. Sorry, sorry, I know she's... Right, if he knows that Genevieve's annoying and also is still in love with him and that she seems to be under the impression that he's having fun before ultimately marrying her, he shouldn't be working with her. It's not conducive to a relationship working to be in that close proximity with someone who is still obsessed with you. No, he's useless. She is talking to some bloke. I had some meetings in London anyway, says Mike. So I thought I'd take in the expo. He glances around at the milling crowds. Attendance looks good. Any news on the Harriet movie release? Movie? Matt tells me nothing. Good, great relationship. What do they talk about? Oh wait, they bicker and have sex. Sure, Mike nods easily, then adds in a lower voice. I hear you're going out to Japan for a while, Matt. 
Reading between the lines, I think they need you out there. It's pretty chaotic. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief when they heard the news. My eyes start towards Matt, waiting for him to explain that he's not going to Japan, but his face is frozen. Right, he says at last, avoiding my gaze. Well, it's a complex situation. Complex? What's complex? Incredible relationship. As you can see, clearly so in love. Talk to each other about everything. Chapter 22. There's a panel discussion going on with Genevieve, Matt and his parents. Ava sits in the audience to watch. It's true, Genevieve opens her eyes wide. He helped me so much on my research and this is no, about Matt obviously, this is no secret to any of you guys. She lowers her voice to an emotional throb, looking around the faces as though, as though to make as much eye contact as possible. He's helped me so much personally. Harriet's house is about love and heart. She blinks earnestly at the crowd. And this man is all about love and heart. Embarrassing, isn't it? Get back together, yells a voice from the rear and Genevieve's trying to stop her face as though she can't hear. Sorry, what are they saying? She says to Matt with a laugh. Get back together, the voice increases in volume. We love you, Matt, a girl cries about three feet from me. You're perfect together, shouts another girl hysterically from across the room. Genevieve and Matt forever. As if this type of behaviour would go on in London, it'd be more likely for them to be like bottled with bottles of piss. Ava decides to leave. Oh no, Genevieve suddenly trills charmingly. I'm so... Two, uh, two Lees there. I'm so sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I think we've upset Matt's new girlfriend. Ava, don't be shy. You're part of the Harriet's house family now. She gestures in my direction and to my horror, a spotlight finds me. Immediately, the whole audience swirls round. And it's all very well, Matt's saying it's all online rubbish, but these people aren't online. They're right here, gaping at me and even taking photos. She's not that pretty, is she? Murmurs a gun in front of me to her friend. And I glare back indignantly. I've just noted, noticed how many times indignant, indignant, indignantly, indignation is used in this book. I swear this is a weird torture porn. Why do I see so much of this in women's fiction? The main character being called unattractive despite bagging a hot guy. Matt definitely isn't with Ava because of her personality or status because he dislikes almost everything about her. So if she's not even that pretty, am I supposed to believe that he's just with her for the sake of it and not because she's actually hot? Why do authors do this? It's embarrassing. Ava goes to a bar to drink her stress away. Every time I discover a new layer to Matt's life, it's a more toxic, complicated layer and he doesn't even seem to see it. He doesn't seem to recognise it. He walks around with blinkers on like some sort of horse pulling a heavy wagon and his job is the wagon. No, his family is the wagon. Why is she bothering? Sunk cost fallacy is a thing if you've been in a relationship for years. You're much more hesitant to give something up if you've already made it to like 5, 10, 15, 20. It gets harder as it goes on, you know? This has been going on for two months. There were problems two weeks in and it hasn't improved. I cannot suspend my disbelief that neither of them won't just sack it off and call it a day already. Ava sees Ronald, Matt's granddad. They commiserate together. Ava learns that he got scammed out of 50k by, well scammers obviously we don't he stops and begins again his eyes fixed on the bar my son is ashamed that i could have been so foolish quite rightly i'm sure he isn't i say quickly although i'm not sure at all the embarrassment that was crackling around the lunch table at matt's parents house seems to make more sense now his family clearly didn't want ronald downloading his story onto me maybe they thought it was inappropriate i can hear elsa's clipped voice now i hardly think but where was their compassion where is their compassion yeah maybe don't marry into this mess Ava gives Ronald her number in case he ever wants to chat because he has no one to chat to. Ava goes to meet Matt for lunch and Genevieve is there being antagonistic. Matt's a sweetheart, obviously, but his family are even lovelier. Elsa and John are like second parents to me, she adds in sincere tone, tones. They're so wise and so fun. I know she's probably exaggerating to wind me up, but even so, I can't help feeling a twinge of sadness because that's exactly how I hoped I'd feel about Matt's parents. I wanted to love them. I wanted to bond and have little in-jokes. I was so optimistic, but truthfully, I can't even imagine Elsa having an in-joke. I have blocked people for way less baggage than this, I'm just saying. Matt told me you love his art collection, Genevieve, I say lightly. The Arlo Housen pieces, I add, just to be totally clear. The ones at his flat? Oh, I do, she nods vigorously. I love his work. Ha ha! caught her out. She does not. She cannot possibly like both a pink watch covered in daisies and a grotesque sculpture of a hairless wolf. It's not feasible. What exactly do you love about his work? I press her, not bothering time my scepticism, but Genevieve doesn't seem to notice. She sips her drink, thinking. I love that it startles me, but then makes me think, she says at last. I love that it's grotesque, but beautiful. I love the concepts behind each piece, although I think you have to read Arlo Halston's autobiography to really understand what he's trying to do, she adds. Monster Dreams. Have you read it? She's less shallow than Ava. I can't believe it. 
I'm having a horrible, terrible dawning as she talks. She genuinely does like the art. She likes it. As I gaze at her immaculate pretty face, I feel a deep sinking inside me. I don't want to compare myself to Genevieve, but oh god, there she is, oozing compatibility with Matland. She adores Matt's art and his parents and family business. She probably loves a well-trained dog too, and a rare steak every night, and I don't like any of them. Well, despite their compatibility, Matt clearly doesn't want to be with Genevieve, and that's totally fine. You don't need to be with someone just because they're 100% compatible. It's not how it works, right? But relationships do need some compatibility and Matt has zero with Ava. Their romance is unbelievable to me. What did I expect? Of course she loves the naked saunas. I expect she has gravity defying boobs and is super proud of her pubis. It probably has its own Instagram account. Ava is immediately more likable and relatable when she's being snarky about someone. Genevieve drops the bombshell that she's moving out to Japan as well to write a book. She tilts her head pityingly, a sly look in her eyes and everything falls into place. I gaze back furiously. Trying to transmit the words that are forming in my head. I see you. You're planning the big Matt and Genevieve reunion in Japan, aren't you? Yep, says Genevieve sweetly, as if she heard every word. My hand is clenching my wine glass more tightly. How could Matt not have told me this? Because you and Matt have zero communication skills, what do you expect? There's zero vegetarian dishes at this expo in London, which seems unbelievable. Apparently Matt's mother didn't bother to tell the chef that, you know, Ava's vegetarian probably on purpose, let's be real. Matt refuses to tell people that he's not going to Japan. So when his parents come over, Ava tells them instead. Why didn't you back me up? Why didn't you just keep your mouth shut? It's not very nice, is it? He retorts in a furious undertone. Jesus, Ava, we're about to have lunch. I have to be diplomatic. This is my family firm. More like your family prison, I spit back. <laughs> Dreamy. Matt, I swallow, barely able to say the words. Are you going to Japan? No, he says at once, but his face isn't saying what his voice is. Are you? I'm, that's not the plan. Are you? My voice is on the shaky. Matt? He obviously is. He's got zero balls. What does she see him in again? Oh yeah, his looks and their sex life. My thoughts are skittering around in a kind of panic because how can I be so out of the loop? How can he be making momentous decisions without any reference to me? Aren't we a team? Aren't we a couple? Don't think he gives a toss, mate. Ava finally gives up and leaves. Chapter 23. Matt doesn't bother to go after Ava, but he texts her instead. And then she softens and asks to meet at his to talk. I head to his building, let myself in with my key. They've been dating for two months and she has a key to his place. Anyway, a girl rings the doorbell. Time for more drama. It's Lyric from the writer's retreat. Remember her like 300 pages ago? Do I know Matt? She gazes at me incredulously. Do I know Matt? Oh my God, a smile of relish curves across her face. He didn't tell you? That's hilarious. We were together. We were a couple. Everyone in this book is contractually obligated to be annoying. Her name is Sarah and she's come by to tell Matt that she's engaged. What, in two months? Yeah, right. As the door closes, there's a kind of buzzing getting louder in my ears. I think I'm going a bit mad. I knew Lyric was attracted to Matt at the retreat. I could tell from the way she looked at him in that fixated way. But how could I have ever imagined she was attracted to him because she was his lover? Everywhere I turn, I feel wrong-footed. I think I've got a handle on who Matt is. I think I understand him in his life. But then something else weird pops up. Secret discussions, private decisions, girlfriends he never thought to mention. Why didn't he tell me? I feel like screaming. Why the hell didn't he tell me? He has issues, no one confront them. Ava takes Matt's golf club and whacks a stool, but then accidentally destroys Matt's Raven artwork piece. Matt comes home at this moment, of course. Ava tells Matt about Sarah. Sarah, it turns out, was Matt's stalker and had followed him to Italy for the martial arts course. Matt has a lot of baggage that he is unwilling to fix and Ava shouldn't have to be the one to be on the receiving end of that stress. I am. I thought we could have a relationship without baggage. I thought it would be all light and free and wonderful, but Topher's right. It's impossible. When I look at you, Matt, I see suitcases all around you. I wait until he raises his head and then gesture with my arms. Heavy, bulky, awkward suitcases everywhere, all in a mess, spilling crap. Japan, Genevieve, your parents, Lyric, and you don't take ownership of them, I say with rising agitation. You don't even look at them. You just go and putt golf balls and hope they'll sort themselves out, but they won't. You need to sort your life out, Matt. You need to sort out your own life. That's what I said. Matt pulls an Uno reverse card to deflect, which is always a winning move in an argument. Is that so? He says at last, his voice ominous. Is that so? You think I'm the only one who needs to sort their life out? You want to hear about your suitcases, Ava? What do you mean? I say startled. You've got so much shit in suitcases, I don't know where to start. He counts off his fingers. Novel, aromatherapy course, rescue furniture, fucking batik. Dog who won't do what he's told, unsafe windows, unpaid bills mixed up with, I don't know, horoscopes. Your life's a mess. It's a bloody mess. He's not wrong. Both of them are idiots. Maybe they do deserve each other. He's complaining about the artwork. Being broken. There are no accidents, chimes in Topher, whizzing into the hall on the child's scooter, then stopping abruptly as he sees the damage. He glances swiftly from me to Matt and I. 
can see him taking in the situation. I mean, there are humans. There are accidents that are just accidents. They have no other significance. Huh, says Matt gruffly. I can't even bring myself to answer. Topher looks from me to Matt and back again, his expression suddenly stricken. Don't break up, guys, he says quietly, and he sounds more sincere than I've ever heard him. It's not a breakup thing, whatever it is. Topher arrives to be great on his little scooter, and then he sucks, because a good friend would suggest that they break up as they don't actually like each other. They decide to break up and then they get a call about Nell who's in the hospital. Ava rejects Matt's help and goes alone. Chapter 24, we have a time skip a whole seven months later. Ava is in Italy finishing her book. Harold is with her. She's been at her own personal writer's retreat for months. I'm sorry, but with what fucking money? Do you shit gold or something? She doesn't even get her invoices sorted out on time. How is she pulled? Months, seven months. Uh, how? How, okay. I've never felt so immersed in anything in my life. I've spent seven days a week thinking, writing, walking, just staring up at the sky. The sky can take a lot of staring at, I've discovered. I'm the first guest to have spent Christmas at the monastery, and I think my request to stay here took Farida by surprise. Sounds great, though. Nell was fine after the hospital stint. Ava has written a book about her dog. She's had a bit of development and has stopped shying away from reality and being fake optimistic all the time. Farida, the writing retreat lady, has a girlfriend called Felicity, who was actually scribed from the beginning. Remember her? You probably don't, because I probably didn't mention her. Who cares? Felicity is also a literary agent. How nice and convenient for Ava. Ava has also learned to WhatsApp less. In fact, the last time I saw any Warwick family member face-to-face was when I made a quick delivery to Matt's parents' house in Berkshire before I left for Italy. I rang the doorbell, and as the door swung open, I couldn't believe my luck, because it was Elsa herself. Oh, hello, I said briskly before she could speak. I've got a present for you. I reached into my carrier bag and pulled out a framed photo of Matt swinging a golf club, which I'd harvested from Facebook. That's for you. I reached for another framed photo of him in a martial arts con tournament. And that's for you. I produced photo after photo until eight framed pictures of Max were teetering in a pile in her arms and Elsa was peering at me over the top of them, looking shell-shocked. I noticed you didn't have any, I said politely. I think your son noticed too. Then I turned on my heel and left. What an insufferable busybody. That is not her drama nor her fight anymore. They broke up. It wasn't her fight in the first place. Go away. Ava Googles Matt once during her time away and finds out that he has quit Harriet's house. Big whoop. Ava decides to go back to London after finishing her book to someone's thing. It's not important, don't worry. But she wants to go in case Matt goes. Get over it. They've been broken up for seven months. That's almost four times as long as they were were together. Chapter 25. Matt isn't at the thing, so Ava decides to go see Nell. This next part really annoyed me. Like, my my blood pressure was rising as I read it. The annoying neighbour from the beginning is parking in Nell's disabled spot. And who comes out to yell at him? Matt. Move your fucking car, he says, and bangs on John Sweetman's car window. Don't you think about parking there. Don't even think about it. My friend needs that space. Move. I don't hear what John Sweetman says in reply, if anything. I'm not sure if I'm functioning. My hand has moved to my mouth and I can't breathe. I mean, Matt? Mm -hmm. Topher appears holding Nell up and Matt helps them apologize to my friend he says shortly my friend my friend this feels to me really on the nose and quite amateurish dialogue to be honest because I don't think adults talk like that in real life I think 12 year olds would talk about that like that in this situation not adult my friend my friend she's got a name like Kinsella was really trying to push a point here. Matt has a key to Nell's house because of course he fucking does. Ava watches all of her other friends show up with Nahal as well. Ava decides to go in and everyone is happy. Of course, it's all very simple. Matt and I split up, but our friends didn't. Our lives didn't. We all gather in Nell's sitting room with drinks and snacks. Then I sip my wine, trying to listen to everyone at once and piece together the story. So when you broke up, Sarika begins, we were like, oh no, because we liked each other. But we didn't get together straight away, except Nell and Topher. They were in touch the whole time. Nell kept going to the hospital in this time, but no one told Ava to prevent her from flying home and distract her from writing and finishing her book. No one told her that Nell basically has a boyfriend, Topher, and that they were all pally pally with Matt and hanging out. Her best friends, no one said a thing about it for seven whole months. You'd have thought it would have come up at least once. Like, oh, we're hanging out. No, blindsided completely. When I first read this, I did think that it was quite bang out of order because these are her best friends keeping all of these secrets from her. Secrets including her shit ex-boyfriend who also kept secrets from her. I found it a bit unbelievable and a betrayal. All well and good them being friends with his friends, but then like them being all pally pally with him and just never mentioning it to her. I, I just didn't like that. Just thought it was out of order. They had a bad, not amicable breakup as well. I had friends that stayed friends with... Actually, one of my really good friends, she stayed friends with like my first ex-boyfriend. 
But that's fine. I didn't mind at the time. She asked, and I was like, oh, whatever, even though it wasn't the most amicable of, you know. And I'm like, you know, I'd say at least acquaintances. Even now, let's say hello every now and then, check in, that kind of thing. It doesn't have to be a big deal, but this guy was an ass. He was an idiot. He was refusing to, whatever. So I take it you're still with Sam, I ask her. Moving into his place next week, says Sarika, a small cross wedding was Dates guy for seven months, moves in with him. All of these people, movers, they're not wasting time, are they? Ava tells them about her book. And an agent likes it, I add, still feeling a pinprick of disbelief as I say the words. She, she wants to represent me. Ridiculous, outrageous, screaming, crying. Nell, I say, sotto, sotto, verse, whatever. Tell me something. Are you in Tofa? I can't. Yeah, I know there are going to be some people in the comment section like, oh, you can't pronounce that. I can read at least like intermediate Japanese. Don't get on at me because I can't pronounce these four syllables. Are you and Topher a couple? No, says Nell at once, withdrawing her hand as though in protest. Jesus, no. These people are in their thirties. My voice is dying. Matt is working with Topher now, partner of his company, whatever. Matt invites Ava for dinner and she says yes, effectively undoing any tiny development she's had in the space of the last chapter. Chapter 26. They are on their date. Give it a rest for one chapter, Kinsella. The best part of this book was the bit that Matt wasn't in. I know who Otolenghi is now, Matt of Volunteers into the silence. I give him 10 marks for conversational guts because that's punchy, right into the heart of things. Amazing, I smile at him. You're a new man. I even bought some Parissa, he adds, and I laugh. Do you like it? Not really, he admits, and I laugh again properly this time. But you're right, I am a new man, he says more seriously. I eat tofu sometimes. You don't, I gape at him. Tofu? I do. I tried it, and you know, it's okay. It's protein. It's fine. I think I could be... Cemeterian, maybe? Half vegetarian? It's a thing, he adds a little defensively. Wow, what a changed man. Get back together already. They both... <laughs> Here's my issue with this. When they were together, they did not grow as people at all. They just butted heads all the time. As soon as they break up, they start growing more as people individually. Separately. Why would you go back and be with someone who you did zero growth with in the first place? You should, I cut him off. It was true, but it's not true anymore. I achieved my goal and it was just, I don't know, I gesture vaguely with my hands. It transformed me. I feel like I'm a new person too. We both are. You look different. Happier. Bro looks happier because they aren't trying to force a failing relationship. Kinsella, do you not realise what you're writing? I went back to that beach, that same olive tree. I sat there and thought about things. Then I saw this pebble and I decided that if I ever saw you again, I'd break off, flushing slightly. Well, here it is, a souvenir. Thank you, I love it. Mine isn't as special, but here goes. Matt hesitates, then draws a battered hard book out of the plastic bag. Book binding for amateurs, 1903, I read aloud. It called out to me as I walked past the charity shop, says Matt, looking sheepish. I thought, I have to rescue that forever. He rescued a book for me. I'm so touched. I can't quite spit me neither. Wordlessly, I turned the old tattered pages, my eyes hot. Jesus wept. Jesus wept even more at this next bit. Their friends have written respective manuals on each other, Averland and Matland. This is priceless, he reads out loud. Averland can be contradictory, unpredictable and erratic, yet it is always joyful, hopeful and colourful. See page seven for Ava's sense of humour. Nope, sense of colour. Who wrote that, I demand, half outraged and half wanting to laugh. Don't know, Maud, Nell, he turns the binder so I can see the page, but it's typed out in some anonymous font. Well, you listen to this, I read from the first page of mine, which is headed, Introduction to Matland. When first approaching Matt, you may believe he cannot hear a word you say. He appears motionless, but as you become attuned to his manner, you will realise he can hear and will react accordingly to his own timescale. See page four, how Matt communicates. I slap the page gleefully. Whoever wrote that knows you. Ah oh, yes, it's the old, we can only force this relationship to endure if our friends also force it and if we have cheat code manuals on each other. The romance swooning. They decide to get back together, I decide to die. We'll realise we have differences and we'll work around that. Yeah, it worked so well the first time. Well, he likes you too. Matt's gaze runs silently up the tall porch light, which is still missing above and I know what he's thinking. I'll replace that, I say hastily. I've been away. I wasn't going to say anything, Matt lifts his hand. I feel a bit dismayed as I push the front door open because we're still prickly. We're still not quite as natural with each other. But maybe it will come. We just need to keep talking. Why are they still trying? Kinsella decides to shit on the audience and give us some good old fashioned emotional manipulation. Harold begins growling at an intruder and runs after him. The intruder is breaking through that back door that Matt was complaining about this whole time. 
He ignores Ava telling him to stop because she hasn't trained him. See what I said? I, do you know what? I'll write that beginning bit before I remembered exactly. I knew, I knew what happened at the end, but I remember. I was right. Matt, I'm sorry my words burst out in a hot, desperate torrent. I'm so, so sorry. You were right all along. I should have fixed the door. I should have bought padlocks. I should have listened to you about the crime stats. I should have listened about everything. No, Matt holds me by the shoulders, his own eyes glistening. You were right all along. Harold's a star. He's a champion. There's nothing wrong with that dog. Nothing. He protected you tonight. Protected you better than I did. I love your dog. I love your dog. He says again, almost fiercely. Really? I falter. Are you kidding? He stares at me, his face suddenly working with emotion. Ava... Harold's still running around outside, by the way. It's important to remember. Ava, I love your life. I love your flat. I love your rescue books and your stupid hot baths and your vegetarian food and your, I don't know, your shit everywhere and your friends and... I've got 300 pages that beg to differ, mate. Kinsella is mugging us off as if we haven't read an entire book of two people desperately pretending they don't despise each other. They hug and continue to say dumb shit to each other in this kitchen and being like, I love you, Lula, while Harold is outside running around. What kind of dog person is Ava? She is pathetic. Unsupervised, nighttime, just running around. Speaking of which, where is he? Matt's head swivels around. We need to go and find him. I assumed he would run back. Time for the manipulation. They finally go to look for Harold, only for Harold to get hit by a car. I move faster than I've ever in my life, but Matt still gets there first and cradles Harold on his lap, his own face white. Harold's breathing his horse. There's blood everywhere. There's mangled fur. I can see bone. Oh, Harold. Harold, my world. I crash down onto the road beside Matt, who tenderly transfers Harold's head onto my lap and gets out his phone. Fucking hit and run, he says, his voice taut as he dials. Monsters. Harold gives a little whine and blood seeps from his mouth. I look at Matt and he looks at me and it's all there. We don't have to say anything. It's all there. All right, Stephen King, calm down. Chapter 27, another time skip, six months later. It's almost like time skips make it convenient for an author to write about how someone has developed without actually doing the hard work of showing us the process. One could almost call it lazy writing. Harold survives, don't worry about him, but he has a prosthetic leg, all thanks to Ava not being bothered enough to go chase him down straight away when he ran out the door after like a burglar. Could have been avoided if she hadn't been mucking around in the kitchen snogging Matt. They're a pair of arseholes. That hasn't changed. Ava's story of Harold is going to be turned into a real book, of course. Sasha came to lunch and met Harold and I told her the story of the accident. It was a bit of a therapy session in the end. And then I said, surely I should put the whole incident in the book because this was part of who Harold was now. Whereupon Sasha became thoughtful and said, maybe leave that story for the sequel. And the next thing was, Felicity phoned me up and said the publishers had changed their mind. They now They now wanted two books two books about Harold. It's unbelievable. You're right. It is unbelievable. Ava gets rich from this enough to quit her job. Matt and Ava get a new mattress for his flat. So what a, what a fantastic character development. The exciting news is Nell and Topher are launching a new political party. Its working name is The Real Life Party. It has 10 members so far. This book has taken the piss out of me. Also, magically, somehow... Don't get hung up on the DLs. Matt's parents are now fine with Ava. That is the magic of a time skip, I suppose. You can say any old shit and the audience has to accept it. I don't add they never mentioned Genevieve because she was caught dealing drugs in a sting because I don't need to. It was all over the Daily Mail Ooh, two months ago. Popular children's influencer offers cocaine to journalists posing as Hollywood agent. Let's be real. Offering a cheeky bump or line to someone is hardly the equivalent of selling pounds of the stuff on the street, you know? Ava is back addicted to WhatsApp, but it's okay now because Matt is as well. Also, Ava likes this shit now. Nihal, I explain, come with me, it's urgent. What? Nihal looks alarmed, but follows me into the living room where I clap my hands. Ladies and gentlemen, I have important news. The number of internet users in the world is approaching 5 billion. What? Matt puts his drink down. How do you know? Because I've been following it obsessively. I tell him proudly. Every hundred words I write, I check the counter. It's like my reward. And now look, you are going to miss it. We're on 499... Nine 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 oh one one eight nine 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 eight eight one nine 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 one one nine seven two five three. I clasp his hand more firmly and breathe out sharply, listening to the voice, listening to the voices. What voices? The ones in our head. Watching the faces, wanting to save this precious but ordinary moment forever. I don't know where we'll go from here, but right now I don't care because I'm here with everything that matters: our friends, our loves, our life. And so somehow everything just magically works out. The end. This is lazy, very, very lazy. Sophie Kinsella could have really done something here. She could have really said something. I know it goes against her genre, 
right? But could, there could be something about Ava and Matt discovering that they are better off single, better off apart, working on themselves, developing as people, lesson learned, maybe don't fall instantly in love with someone when you don't know their name. But no, we had to backtrack, put them back together and magically all of the previous problems were just fixed, literally by magic. What I don't like about this is because I think it sends out a message that if you try hard enough, you can make someone change enough so you can actually stand being around them instead of just finding someone more compatible. I think it sends out a bad message. I did not root for either character. Matt was bland and boring and Ava was a nitwit. My pain is constant and sharp and I do not hope for a better world for anyone. In fact, I want my pain to be inflicted on others. I want no one to escape. But even after admitting this, there is no catharsis. My punishment continues to elude me and I gain no deeper knowledge of myself. No new knowledge can be extracted from my telling. This confession has meant nothing. This book was a waste of time and so is this video complaining about it, but I hope you enjoyed another one of these mega long videos about bloody... Look, I've just been holding a grudge against this book since February, so I had to get it out there. Do let me know what you think. Is this insufferable? Does the romance comedy genre owe it to itself to do a bit better than this, think about the message that they maybe take it. I don't know. Tell me what you guys thought. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Check out my merchandise lines. We got some new Christmas merch, you know, for Christmas. Check out my podcast channel, my third channel. <laughs> Thank you to NordPass for sponsoring today's video. And that's all. I'm going to go to bed before either one of you does something that gets us killed or worse, expelled, something like that. I'm going to bed. I'm tired. Laters. Thank you. Bye.